is the Wednesday, September 13th, 2023 morning session of the Portland City Council. Keelan, good morning. Please call the roll. Good morning. Gonzalez. Aye. Maps. Here. Rubio. Here. Ryan. Here. Wheeler. Here. Here. We'll hear from legal counsel on the rules of order and decorum. Welcome to the Portland City Council. To testify before council in person or virtually, you must sign up in advance on the council agenda at www.portland.gov slash council slash agenda. Information on, on, on engaging with city council can be found on the council's clerk's webpage. The presiding officer preserves order and decorum during city council meetings. The presiding officer determines the length of testimony. Individuals generally have three minutes to testify unless otherwise stated. A timer will indicate when your time is done. Disruptive conduct such as shouting, refusing to conclude your testimony when your time is up, or interrupting others' testimony or council deliberations will not be allowed. If you cause a disruption, a warning will be given. Further disruption will result in ejection from the meeting. Anyone who fails to leave once ejected is subject to arrest for trespass. Additionally, council may take a short recess and reconvene virtually. Your testimony today should address the matter being considered. When testifying, state your name for the record. Your address is not necessary. Disclose if you're a lobbyist. If you are representing an organization, please identify it. For Testifiers joining virtually, please unmute yourself once the council clerk calls your name. Thank you. Thank you. Before we begin our formal agenda, I want to acknowledge we have some students here in the balcony from PCC. I understand you're international students. Is that correct? Terrific. Terrific. And you're here just to see how local government works. We appreciate you being here. Cody, thanks. How did the tour go? All right, great. Well, we hope not to disappoint. So uh, thank you for being here. We appreciate your presence. We'll start with communications, please. Keelan, item number 758. Request of Robert Butler to address council regarding violation of equity for small business compared to large business. Mr. Butler, welcome. In person. Oh. Apologize for that. <laughs> <laughs> That's my line. I tell people I look better on virtually than I do in person. Well, good morning, uh, the most underpaid civil servants in Portland, Oregon. Uh, thank you for your dedication. I'm Robert Butler, a native of Portland. So I wanted to talk to you today a little bit about uh, something that's important to all of us, which is diversity, equity, and inclusion. And I'm going to suggest that we probably mostly all agree that that should include all classes of people in our Portland, all legal classes, should get diversity, equity, and inclusion. And the class that I'm going to talk to you about is small business, as compared to other business, which maybe we'll call large business. And in small business, that doesn't happen in Portland. And small employers have a bias against them in the way the business tax code is treated. And the bias is to result in the fact that there is a greater burden on small business compared to large business. Now, small business represents 40% of all our employees. So this is a significant class, even though extremely weak class with almost no political power compared to large business. And I'll mention, first of all, that uh, it's in our code already, city tax code, that all classes, uh, all taxes in Portland should be treated in, in confirmation to the Oregon Department of Revenue taxes. In other words, we should be on the same basic set of rules 
Unfortunately, we are not. And what happens is that some time ago, uh, Mayor Goldsmith was convinced that small employers would cook the books, basically have two sets of books. And one set of books for Portland taxes would say that there is no profit this year, and they'll do that by giving themselves bonuses to the point where there's no profit. Then they pay no taxes. So Mayor Goldsmith decided that for, at the point of $60,000, if you made more than that, we would take everything over and above that, maybe $40,000, move it right down to the bottom line of your tax return, and we're gonna add that to your income tax, net income, as additional net income, which I call phantom income. And this is uh, a, a mistreatment of small business. And you would just have a handout showing that if we were to eliminate lines number uh, seven, or pardon me, nine and 14, that we would be back comparable to the Oregon Department of Tax Revenue in compliance, what I feel, of, of diversity, equity, and inclusion. And I urge this council to finally make this change and eliminate this mistreatment and bias against small business and quit saying that every time someone makes over, in this case today, over $125,000, they're cheating on taxes and that they will be punished by additional tax accordingly. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Appreciate it. Next individual, please, item 759. Request of Mimi German to address council regarding the people yeah, ask for justice here. versus the state of city yeah, council. Who's he's referring to? No. Should we ask? Yeah. What's wrong? Uh, uh, Mayor. Just wanna, yeah, I just want to make sure. Just one, one second. Robert, you've mentioned the documents. Do you have them? I have them. Oh, okay, okay great. great. That's Thank why you. I want to make sure we have them. Yeah. Thank Thanks. Yeah. Uh, Mimi German. I don't think they've joined us. All right, next individual, 760. Request of Patrick Cashman to address council regarding misuse of emergency ordinances. Joining us online. Welcome. I'm sorry, good morning, do you hear me now? Yep, loud and clear. Fantastic, thank you very much. Well, this should probably provide a nice contrast for the visitors. Uh, I was disappointed in the council's decisions regarding item 630 on the July 26th agenda. Council voted to reassign $3 million in federal COVID assistance from whatever pretense the city originally claimed when they applied for the federal money. Regardless, the council voted for it unanimously. The most disappointing thing about it, however, more than the idea of using federal disaster relief to pay for a city property capital improvement, more than the city and GSA ignoring the federal regulations and their own policy requiring payment of full fair market value. More than the city having no documentation whatsoever of their claim in the ballot package that, quote, the grants management division has reviewed and determined that this eligible use of ARPA funds, and then claiming the exact opposite in the very next paragraph, with no public involvement was sought for this transaction as the ultimate end use is not known at this time. The really disappointing thing is how the council used one council member's claim need for an emergency vacation to rush this through without public participation or even acknowledging the written testimony provided well in advance. As a result, I feel it necessary to reach out to city employees and remind them of the absolute mountain of federal money the city and their agencies, such as Prosper Portland, have received over the last few years, much of it in a sloppy hurry. So let me ask you a few questions. Do you want to look at your babies and grandbabies and tell them no matter what school you get into, I promise I will make it happen? Do you want to take the whole family on a dream vacation for experiences spoken of for generations? Are you aware of literally any amount of federal money that was requested, used, accounted for, or reported in a manner less than fully 100% above board? You got the emails? Good news. You too can now explore the wonderful opportunities of federal whistleblowing in which you are rewarded with from 15 to 30% of collected proceeds under the False Claims Act. Plus, as an extra bonus for city employees, you get the full federal whistleblower protection package, which is like plus 100 employment armor forever, because no boss wants to give the feds even a whiff of whistleblower retaliation. You can play as often as you like, and even if you don't land a big fish, the small bounties, they start adding up fast. 
like that five grand in federal money we spent on a Tyco drum circle to fight coronavirus. Save off a couple emails or texts and contact the National Whistleblower Center at whistleblowers.com. One final note of caution, however. After the 2008 financial crisis, Senator Leahy of Vermont pushed claims to the False Claims Act, which governs such whistleblowing. It removed the requirement for non-public information. So now any citizen can be a whistleblower and file if they have assembled a convincing portrait of fraud or mismanagement, even from public, publicly available documents, and are willing to cover the filing fee. Such private citizens earn the same reward. Only one reward is awarded for each instance, because at that point, if you aren't the whistleblower, you are a co-conspirator. You currently have unfiltered access to the databases and emails a private citizen would have to skillfully navigate and pay a lot through the public records process to even get a sniff of. But there is a lot of money at stake. So eventually, one of us will. I would recommend contacting the National Whistleblower Center at whistleblowers.org immediately. Currently, you have a head start on doing the right thing. Thank you, Patrick. Next individual, please, item 761. Request of Danielle Mailer to address council regarding fatal crash review committee initiation. Welcome. Thank you for being here. Good morning, Mayor and Commissioners. Morning. For the record, my name is Danielle Maillard, and I'm a walking programs manager representing Oregon Walks, a pedestrian safety and advocacy organization. I'm here today to ask you to support the implementation of a fatal crash review committee in which public and private entities can work together to address the traffic violence on our streets. We wrote a letter to you with what kind of, what the type of committee could accomplish if given the teeth to do so. In 2021, 30 pedestrians were lost to traffic violence and additional 528 lives were changed forever, as that year saw 429 emergency room visits and 99 hospitalizations. This does not have to be the reality of our streets. This morning, I had the opportunity to be part of the James John walking school bus and bike bus and watch the community come together for coffee and muffins before leading a group of about 20 students to school. I was told that the regular walking leader was hit by a car while walking, breaking many bones in her body and still she wants to lead the students on her new mobility scooter because the value of community and walking to school is that important to her. After this comment, I'm headed to plan for the World Day of Remembrance, that's planned in October, to honor those who have lost their lives to traffic violence, and this year that number's already at 47 in Portland. I'll follow up about this event, but I hope by the time I speak in front of families who have lost their loved ones next month, I can share that our leaders and elected officials are willing to come together and create a space where we can all learn from these tra tragedies and mitigate further damage to our community. In the meantime, I ask that you encourage and support PBOT in putting out the inexpensive infrastructure solutions that will save lives today. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Commissioner Maps has a comment. Sure, uh, just very quickly, uh, Danielle, thank you so much for being here today and thank you for your um, advocacy on behalf of safe transportation. This is a um, shared value that um, I think everyone on this council embraces. Um, I also want to thank you for the letter recommending that we um, develop a more robust um, strategy for reviewing fatal crashes. I've received that letter uh, and have directed PBOT to get back to me with a recommendation by next Friday. So give me about a week and a half to um, both hear back from the Bureau in terms of their recommendations on best pass forward and then I will uh, get a response out to you in about 10 days. Thank you, I sure. appreciate it. Thank you. Next individual please, item 762. Request, uh, request of Ann Bazay to address council regarding abandoned vehicles. Welcome. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, my name is Ann Bazaid, and I would largely like to address um, the RV campsites that are in my neighborhood. Um, my daughter and I uh, bought a duplex on Southeast Ankeny uh, in October of last year. I retired from my job in Seattle, Washington. I was the director of the therapy department for University of Washington <coughs> Medical Center in February and moved to the duplex uh, in February of 2023. <coughs> Since that time, a number of RVs have occupied Southeast Ankeny 
between uh, 20th and 24th Avenue, including a bicycle chop shop and several RVs that had what I would consider very dangerous individuals living in them, including a tin shack that had written on it, the kill shack. The situation became incredibly unsafe. My neighbors and I contacted PDX reporter 311, the non-emergency 503 number, the police several times, and uh, I talked to Commissioner Mapp's office, uh, Jackson in particular, very delightful man, I might say, and uh, impact reduction team, I talked to Sharon, wonderful person, as well as um, Mike Krebs from the vehicle inspection team. In the meantime, <laughs> my daughter, we witnessed several beatings, many bicycles coming in at four o'clock in the morning to the bicycle chop shop and being dismantled by the person who operates it. We're 500 feet within Lamont School. There's children walking by all the time. We witnessed two ODs and the beatings of two young women who were partially clothed. This is happening on the streets of Portland in real time. It's happening today in neighborhoods throughout Portland. I'm particularly concerned about my neighborhood because I live there and I would like my grandchildren to be able to visit me. And right now they can't. It is not safe. I can't, we've been trying to work on our duplex and I'm unable to have the windows delivered because the, the company won't come because it's unsafe. Mike Krebs let me know that on September 21st, this group of RVs will be tagged and then removed on the 28th. My concern is this was considered a priority removal in June of this year. And it's not happening until September 21st. And after September 28th, what is the guarantee that it won't happen again? You have great teams out there. I've talked to many different people from the police to 503 to 311 to Mike Krebs to Sharon. These are fantastic teams. Please empower them to clean up the streets of Portland and make Portland safe again. Thank you. Uh, Commissioner Maps, and then I, 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 I want to uh, have a comment as well. Commissioner Maps. Sure. Um, and thank you for coming in today. Um, we're neighbors. I live about three blocks away from you. I don't know if you see me around the neighborhood, but I used to literally take my kid um, down to the bus stop at 20th and Burnside. And we've actually been run off from that space because of um, folks going through mental health crises. I go by the street that you're talking about literally on a daily basis. I completely get it. I completely live with it. Um, your information is the same information that I have. Uh, we're gonna post it on the 21st of this month. And if vehicles are still there, we're gonna tow them by the 28th. I, uh, and you are also absolutely right that this is a problem which is um, happening throughout the city. Uh, we need to do better in this space. I do want to thank my colleagues on council who made I think an additional $2 million available in this past budget process that'll help us ramp up our efforts to get RVs um, into more appropriate spaces. Uh, um, and we're deeply committed to getting better in this space. Um, I also uh, very much appreciate you sharing the praise for our staff over at PBOT. I do think that PBOT um, reacting to the needs on the street has evolved from uh, not just a transportation bureau, but a bureau that does a lot of um, outreach, especially to our most vulnerable houseless neighbors. Um, I could not sing their praises loud enough. Uh, at the same time, if we're gonna succeed in this space, I know we gotta do better, and this is something that um, I will be thinking of as we enter our next budget process, uh, which literally uh, will begin in a matter of weeks. Uh, so again, thank you uh, so much for being here. Thank you for your patience. When you see me on the street, uh, wave and I'll try to do the same. And Mr. Mayor, I'll hand it back to you. Yeah, I, I, I just, I wanna say this. This, this is obviously a, a large and it's a thorny issue and you're correct that it is widespread. It's not just your neighborhood. But first I wanna apologize for what you and your neighbors have had to endure. 
Uh, I support Commissioner Maps as our transportation commissioner. He's been a strong leader on this front, particularly with the derelict RVs. Um, this council wrote a letter to the governor yesterday uh, expressing our hopes and aspirations for the governor's task force on Portland, which you know, th this is center of target for the types of issues that people are experiencing. Uh, we have requested additional support from the legislature for funding specifically related to derelict RVs. We've stood up new programs at the city level to dispose of them. Uh, to be clear, uh, most of them are non-functional. A lot of them don't have appropriate sewer systems. Yes, um, I'm aware of that. So we, we have set aside funding and sent out crews to actually deal with those scenarios. And I dare say there is more we can do, given that it is an increasingly common for people who want to dispose of an old RV to simply scrape all of the VIN and identification information and leave it parked on a street corner with the keys in it. I'm hearing this anecdotally over and over again. Um, maybe what should happen is people should post a modest bond and when they appropriately sell and document the sale of their RV or appropriately dispose of their RV and document it, then they get that bond plus interest back. Uh, but in, in the meanwhile, it feels like people have found an easy way to get rid of their problem. And then, of course, a lot of those RVs, uh, you know, there, there's some very uh, you know, honest, hardworking people who are, who are trying to get out of a difficult situation. But as you described, there are also people engaged in illicit criminal activity, including the manufacturing and distribution of drugs, human trafficking, and other problems. Um, and so I, I just want you to know this is something the police bureau is on. It's something the Bureau of Transportation under Commissioner Maps is engaged in. It's something that we're all dealing with from a livability perspective and a community perspective. I'm sorry that it, it takes as long as it takes for these hot spots to be remediated. We, we have substantially increased IRP, the Impact Reduction Program. I'm glad that, that you were treated with professionalism and kindness uh, when you spoke to those individuals and, and members of Commissioner Mapp's team. That's, that's what we want the public to see. We, we can't solve these problems quickly enough, and we acknowledge that, and we're scaling it. Uh, but we also want you to see that, that we're on it and we care about it, we care about you and your neighbors. And, and I think it's fortuitous that Commissioner Maps is one of your <laughs> neighbors. So he, he's in it with you, and, and collectively everyone in this room is in it with you. So I, I, I'm sorry this has happened to you and your neighbors, and I look forward to that event on the 21st being successful, and I agree with you that then there's upstream solutions required to make sure we're not just back there in another six months doing exactly the same thing. Thank you so much. I, I would also just like to bring up one more thing. Sure. Um, during this process, my daughter's tires were slashed, and then we rented a car to so she could have a car during that time period, and all the tires were stolen off of it. Um, so I do think people who are left in this, these situations and these criminal acts happen to them, that since the city isn't responding swiftly enough to prevent these criminal acts, there should be a way to compensate people for the damages that they endure while we're waiting for some action. Mm -hmm. okay. Thank you. I, Mayor, I had a, yeah, Commissioner Gonzalez. Oh, oh, my hand was up. Oh, 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 I'm, I'm sorry. sorry, Commissioner Ryan, okay, then Commissioner okay, Gonzalez. Okay, cool. Sorry, Dan. And first of all, thank you for your distinguished career at University of Washington. It made sense as I listened to your testimony. They were, it was, a, it was really obvious what your professional uh, background was. It was so thoughtful. It was actually, we hear a lot of themes such as yours, but I have to say that was the most compelling, thoughtful testimony I've heard in a long time. There's a, a RV safe park that opened up, and it's, um, it fills up about five units a week. It's more complex to move them in because the people moving into the tiny homes are coming from conditions on the street and for them to move into a tiny home is a big step. People that have RVs and such um, are very independent. Um, there's a whole host of reasons why they want them. You got into the organized crime aspect. They're not the ones that are saying yes to services for the reasons that I think you understand because you mentioned them. 
but I just wanted you to know that that will fill up and then we will need more. Um, and that's a, a, a complex, longer conversation that someone like you could um, be helpful in. I wanted to ask um, you a favor, if you could, because you're so compelling and you're such a, it's such a great testimony. The city can't do it alone. So we work with our partners at the county and also at the state. And I think it's really important that these messages get to the county because they're the other half of all of our um, action that we're doing. So when the first responders at the city, they have to work with the county when it comes to treatment centers, when it comes to um, jurisdictions, prosecutions, jails, all of which has been defunded quite a bit over the last X amount of years. And so I hope that you'll take that there. And also the state legislature needs to hear from Portlanders of what they're experiencing. So we're not pegged to some law and order um, system here in local government. We're just actually doing all we can to be responsive to this emergency crisis, the humanitarian crisis that you've spelled out. And our goal is to make sure that you as a grandma can have your children visit as soon as possible. Thank you so much for being here today. Thank you. Yeah, Could and the drug trade, the, the sex trade. contact information for those other areas. I'm happy to provide information yeah. to the county and state. Thank you, but you just, you weaved it all together with the fact that we have a drug trade, sex trade, and the chop shop trade, however you want to call oh, yeah, that. we've got it. All in the open market just on your block. Just come to Southeast Ankeny, you'll see it all. Yeah, and you're right, those hot spots are all over the city, not just downtown, thank you. I just wanted to echo Commissioner Ryan's point about really taking the eye off the ball on criminal justice at, as a region and as a state. And again, we get pegged because we're the ones stuck with enforcing at the city as being overly law and order oriented at times. But I, I don't know how we respond to this livability crisis without a, a, a more firm response there. I mean, that's uh, exactly because of what you're going through. And we will continue to build shelter. We will continue to offer services. Um, but until we address these criminal elements for, as they are, uh, and be, to be real clear, these are people that are service resistant. They're not asking for our services. They don't take it when we, at least a certain segment, uh, don't take it when they're offered. And so uh, appreciate your testimony very much. Um, I, I had a quick question for Commissioner Maps and the mayor, maybe just as a reminder for all of us. Um, when we are looking at RVs, do we have to go through this? Are we posting those the same way we post camps? Or what is the what is techni the technical legal process on RVs currently? Sure. For um, Without getting too deep, deep in the weeds, you can kind of think of there are two. There are RVs that people are vehicles that people live in, and then there are abandoned cars. Uh, abandoned cars we will not talk about. That's a much more straightforward in some ways process. Let's just talk about uh, um, vehicles that have people living in them. We do need to post them. So for example, in this particular example, so we're talking 20th and Ankeny-ish, uh, we'll post it, it stays posted for about a week, and then we'll go in actually on the 28th and, um, and then tow the vehicles if they're still there. Does that answer your question? It does, and it's concerning, right? Because if, if you know, it, it, in addition to the help uh, and resources from the state, we need help in the way Oregon law is written. I mean, it, it, it puts incredible, we, we get in this vicious cycle of doing this over and over again with our camps and our RVs, uh, and uh, it's, it's just a never ending story with this segment of this population. Particularly painful is those engaged in criminal enterprise uh, that exploit state law um, terrorize our community in a, in a real way, so it's. And, and the, the Commissioner Gonzalez, uh, thank you for that question and uh, um, I'll use this as an opportunity to do some public education here. So I do have to post them, wait a little bit of time before we tow them, then we tow them and I take possession of them. I have, or Peabot takes possession of them. Peabot has to hold on to them for 30 days in case folks wanna come back um, and um, re reclaim their property um, if after 30 days um, no one comes and claims it uh, I will likely have it crushed uh, which again costs Peabot and the people of Portland uh, hundreds if not a couple of thousand thousands of dollars one of the other bottlenecks in this space is um, 
as I tow RVs, I have to put them someplace for 30 days. And one of the things uh, that the mayor's office and I have been working on over the last several months is to try to find additional space to store the RVs that we tow so I can store them for 30 days so they can either be returned to their owners or sent to the crushers. Um, and those are some of the bottlenecks that uh, define the dynamics of this space. And, and the only thing I have to add is a good many, not all, but a good many of those RVs are hazmat sites oh, yeah. by the time they come into the possession of Peabot and they have to be remediated as such. And that's where you get into the thousands yeah. of dollars. And that's part of the challenge of the safe rest of the park is that we have to do a lot of work to make sure they're safe when they get to the park. Yeah. Well, and I think what's hard to hear about that is right now they're in the streets of Portland and they're not safe. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah we're totally understood, yeah. It's, it's this complex. And the good news is we're starting to build. So we're hoping that when we partner with the county, we can build more. Yeah, thanks. Thanks for being thank here. Thank you so much. And for thank your you. Time. Great, great discussion. Thank you. Thanks, Commissioner Maps. Sure. Uh, that completes communications. We'll go to the consent agenda. Have any items been pulled off the consent agenda? Uh, one item, 768. 768 has been pulled, and Commissioner Gonzalez, you're pulling that, is that correct? That's, That's correct. Okay. We'll we just wanted that. a little bit more information from your team. Not, to, not a problem. We'll, we'll move that to the, to the end of the regular agenda. We'll move to the first time certain item, please. Item number 763, which is a non-emergency ordinance. Mr. Mayor, did you intend for us to vote on the consent? Oh, yeah, you know what? That'd be a good idea, wouldn't it? Let's vote on the consent agenda, just because Commissioner Maps thinks right. we should. Please call the roll. Gonzalez. Aye. Maps. Aye. Rubio. Aye. Ryan. Aye. Wheeler. Aye. The consent agenda is adopted. First time certain seven, 763 non emergency ordinance. Amend the local improvement district boundary and create a new assessment zone for the Northeast 46th Avenue and Bryant Street local improvement district to construct stormwater improvements on Northeast 42nd Avenue and on Northeast Columbia Boulevard. Commissioner Maps. Uh, colleagues, this item comes to us from PBOT. If adopted, this ordinance would expand the size and scope of a local improvement uh, district which already already exists. This boundary adjustment would create a new assessment zone, which will pave the way for the construction of stormwater improvements on Northeast 42nd Avenue and Northeast Columbia Boulevard. Here to tell us more about this uh, ordinance, we have Andrew Abbey with uh, PBOT and Daniel Jenkins with BES. Uh, welcome, Andrew and Daniel. Thank you, Commissioner Maps. Uh, I'm Andrew Abbey, the city's local improvement district administrator. I'm joined today by Daniel Jenkins from the Bureau of Environmental Services. Uh, we are gonna go right into our sh brief presentation. Next slide, please. So, um, Council previously formed this LID, and I do want to note that we received no remonstrances against LID formation when we originally formed this LID. Um, I would characterize the sentiment of the existing property owners in the LID that they want us to build this LID as quickly as possible because there's a lot of need in this, in this area. So the current LID amount is roughly $12.3 million. Um, the ordinance in front of you today proposes to increase it by about another $1.3 million. Um, BES has generally, generously offered up nearly a million dollars in uh, ratepayer funds for the proposed scope addition. So if council approves this ordinance at the second reading uh, next week, the total project budget will increase to $15.7 million. Um, as I noted, there were no remonstrances received uh, originally at LID formation, and I'm also pleased to note that, that, that there were no remonstrances received against this proposed um, scope expansion. Next, next slide, please. So I wanted to just give you a little bit of an overview. This project is in the Cully neighborhood. Um, Cully is our most diverse neighborhood in the city of Portland, and historically, um, the city and the county have not done well by funding infrastructure in the Cully neighborhood. 
Um, I just want to give you a little snapshot of what this LID attempts to begin addressing. So if you look at the Cully neighborhood, 9.0% of the streets in Cully are unpaved versus a citywide average of 2.7%. So that means that if you live in Cully, um, you are more than three times likely to live or own a business on a street that doesn't, on a street that is not paved. There are no residential properties in this LID. They're all, they, they are all commercial in nature. And I would also just note that the sidewalk coverage ratio in Cully, less than a third of the streets in Cully have sidewalks versus almost two thirds citywide. Um, and this, this is a very diverse census area where this LID is located. Um, over a third of the people um, uh, are a minority and the median income is less than $45,000 a year. Next slide, please. So the current LID scope, um, we packed a lot into this existing LID. So if you look at where that green square is in the northeast corner of the LID, um, that is where we are building a stormwater outfall to the Columbia Slough. So you can see that picture there, the lower right, that's Northeast 46th Avenue. There's no stormwater management on the street. So the water just sort of sits there and percolates into the ground. And there's a lot of bad stuff going into that stormwater. Um, so we will build stormwater facilities and uh, appropriately treat and convey that stormwater before it outfalls to the Columbia Slough. And that will be a new stormwater outfall. Next slide, please. So this, this uh, green square that you see in front of you is um, where we're gonna build a new east-west street connection so that the small businesses on the street can safely get out to Northeast 47th Avenue so that they're not taking their life into their hand trying to make a left turn onto Columbia Boulevard from Northeast 46th Avenue. Uh, next slide, please. And then this, this circle here shows where we're gonna put in a new traffic signal, signal on a high crash corridor at the intersection of Northeast 42nd and Lombard. Recently had a small business owner in the LID contact me and he was very anxious for us to get out to bid because he's, his uh, employees have had three accidents trying to egress from Northeast 42nd Avenue onto Columbia Boulevard. And again, I wanna stress this is already in the LID. I'm just, um, trying to provide an overview for council that we're really trying to be thoughtful and very comprehensive, that we don't take a siloed approach when we do these LIDs. We really try to look at everything that needs to be done in the area and do them all at once. Next slide, please. So uh, the map that you see there is the Columbia Flu. You can see that it stretches from the confluence of the Columbia and Willamette Rivers, pretty much east to Troutdale. Um, there's, this is a very valuable uh, hydrological and ecological resource for the city of Portland. Um, so BES has had efforts underway for decades to help clean up the Columbia flu. And I'm very pleased that the LID can be a component of help helping to further that objective. Next slide, please. So, um, when we're looking at treating stormwater, this is not a nice to have thing. Uh, this is decades of work by the Bureau of Environmental Services uh, to work with the federal regulatory authorities to uh, do what we need to do to appropriately treat stormwater. And Daniel will share more about that in a minute. So really what we're talking about here is there's the obligation of the Bureau of Environmental Services, but also private property owners to treat the stormwater that is on their private property, and this proposed LID amendment helps to uh, do that in a cost-effective way. Next slide, please. So um, if you look at the, um, the two green squares there, those are the properties that we propose to newly include in the LID. Um, for me, this was really just a matter of common sense. What I didn't want to do as, as the city's LID administrator, not PBOT's LID administrator, but as the city's LID administrator, uh, notwithstanding that the Bureau of Transportation is the responsible bureau for the LID, when BES first approached me about doing this, I didn't want the answer to be, well, this is the PBOT project. Um, you go figure it out in, on your own, BES. What was very clear to me is that it did not make sense for us to spend the property owner's money to build a new concrete street on Northeast 42nd Avenue and a new concrete intersection in Northeast 42nd and Columbia Boulevard and not plan ahead by putting the piping in so that eventually these properties that you see circled here in green 
had a way of disposing of the stor their stormwater on private property. What we did not want to do is to punt and say, we'll deal with that later. You come in later, you rip up what the LID just built, and you figure it out on your own, and you pay for it on your own, where it would obviously be much more expensive. Next slide, please. So um, I'm just going to give you a quick recap here before I hand it over to, to Daniel. Um, we received some thoughtful testimony yesterday. Um, I just want to share a few excerpts of that testimony because I think it really summarizes this proposed amendment well. Um, what it said was this amendment takes advantage of public right of way to assist with public and private stormwater runoff. What that means is, is that by approving this amendment, what we do as a city is we go back to these property owners and we say, you don't have a dozen property owners that each individually have to go build postage stamp sized facilities on their own individual properties, gobbling up valuable industrial land to treat stormwater. And everybody does it on a piecemeal basis where instead we can build two stormwater facilities in the public right of way and they don't have to give up their valuable industrial land to try to treat their stormwater on site. Um, the testimony also said uh, Multnomah County Drainage District expect this project to reduce hazard, haz hazardous material runoff flowing from the street into the Columbia Slough. That's an important environmental objective. This project is forward-looking and pragmatic, and it builds stormwater improvements on a relatively small budget today to meet future requirements. So that summarizes uh, my component of the presentation, and I'll turn it over to Daniel to provide you um, some background on the outreach we did with property owners and some of the technical details of the stormwater improvements. Hello. Uh, oh. Hello, my name is Daniel Jenkins. I work for the Bureau of Environmental Services as a stormwater engineer. Um, I've been working on this project since early concept. Uh, we've reached out to Andrew to kind of combined our outfall project with the LID. Uh, the purpose of the outfall project is to treat 12 acres of uh, impervious and poorly draining uh, soil that generates a bunch of stormwater and then flows into our outfall. Uh, the Columbia Slough is a heavily impacted water body and so all of the stormwater generated from these 12 acres go currently untreated into the slough. Um, of the 12 acres, eight acres of the area is actually private property, while the other four is right away. And this new system will actually treat both of those into one or two combined treatment facilities. Uh, that'll be accomplished by rerouting some of the existing storm sewer, uh, connecting, reconnecting all the private connections into this new system, and then having two treatment vaults that will treat all the storm water before it continues along the outfall. Um, we're hoping that you can support this new project. BES typically does not have joint public-private facilities like this, and so this is a new concept for areas that um, really fit this type of unique circumstance where everything's shedding into one specific point, and we can get the most bang for our buck and, and uh, provide the most amount of treatment for both public and private infrastructure. So I think that concludes our presentation this morning. I don't believe that anybody has signed up to testify, so I'll turn it back to council to see if you have any questions. Very good. Colleagues, any questions at this particular juncture? Commissioner Maps? Uh, it looks like I'll Commissioner let Commissioner Ryan go. Yeah, it's great to have PBOT and BES here at the same time, um, both the messages you gave about the safety with the red lights and then obviously the the cleaner water that we need in uh, the slough. How long have you all been partnering? Was it in the first LID, or did this evolve as we go into the extension? Uh, BES uh, assists in the review and design of LIDs when they trigger stormwater management. Um, so I have actually been the reviewer for the outfall project uh, as part of this LID. And when I was assigned the, uh, the, the other outfall project, uh, since I have already worked with Andrew um, on on the existing LID, uh, we've been working together to con to combine the two projects. So I'd say probably about two years now. Good, good. And when you did the first one, when was the first one passed? This is an extension, correct? Correct. Okay. Yeah, and maybe if I could just add to that, I, I think the that nuance context. here is that this is the first time that we've really taken a, a B BES identified capital improvement. I don't want to say the first time. I'm going to back up here, but. 
is probably the second time we've taken an identified uh, BES capital improvement project where BES had it on their, I don't know, short, medium, long-term capital plan to get something done and it's like, oh, this fits really well for the LID to build. The first example of that would have been the Northeast 47th Avenue LID a block away where BES had planned to extend sanitary sewer and it would have been really, really expensive for BES all on their own with ratepayer dollars to rebuild Northeast 47th Avenue. So that was an example where um, PBOT brought most of the money to the table were reconstructing 47th and also could extend um, sanitary sewer. So it's not all that often that we are able to take a previously identified B BES CIP priority and help fund it with an LID, but um, this has really been a positive partnership and I'm hoping that we can do more of that moving forward. I agree, and kudos to you, Commissioner Maps, for having all this under your portfolio. I'm sure that was helpful as a part of that synergy. Um, usually I be, I'm somewhat critical when these come because uh, the people on fixed income that are part of it that see their, their um, burden go up when these go in, and, and I always am sensitive to that. So are there any, res I don't think there are any residential neighborhoods in this area, correct? Correct. So it's it was all commercial. All commercial properties. Okay. Um, and then we've done outreach to all those commercial properties, sent letters and actually gone door to door to all the yeah. commercial properties. Uh, myself and my PI, uh, public information lead, have actually gone door to door to all these commercial businesses and talked to them about the benefits of the LA. And they're all in for this investment. Yes, we have one person that was willing to provide testimony to that. Okay, sounds good. Thank you. Thank you for working together. Thank you. And I would just add, uh, Commissioner Ryan, we also don't want to burden property owners by throwing up roadblocks to these small businesses growing and expanding and providing living wage jobs, which are desperately needed in the Culley neighborhood. So if these small businesses on their own were to want to expand, they would go through the development review pro process and then they, we, we probably, I'm not the BES reviewer or development review, but my sense is they'd be told, you need to go build your postage stamp size facility. And oh, by the way, you need to put in all the piping and you need to rip up the street. And I don't mean to repeat what I said earlier, but we really do want to remove all those roadblocks to these small businesses um, prospering over the years. I would also just add, you know, without the BES funding, the maximum assessment would be $170,000. With the BES funding that was provided for the new um, assessment zone, that brings the maximum assessment to under $97,000 and the median assessment is $57,000. So for the average um, small business property here, it's about $350 a month. Not insignificant, but as was mentioned in one of the written testimony that was submitted, um, the property owner said this project add value for me. Yes, Andrew, I, I totally agree with that. That was my point. And I'm just distinguishing how different that is when we have property owners that are residents. Yeah, yeah. thanks for that distinguishing Good. fact. Mm -hmm. Commissioner Max. Um, just as we wrap up today on this item, I want to thank Andrew and Daniel for their presentation. And I also want to compliment uh, both of you and everyone else who worked on this project. I think it really embodies um, the new direction that the city of Portland's trying to go into, uh, breaking down silos between uh, different bureaus and actually uh, sponsoring more partnerships between the public sector and the private sector. Um, I think this is what good government looks like. And I really appreciate everyone who got us here today. Thank you. Excellent work. Well done. Do we have uh, public testimony on this item? No one signed up. All right. Very good. This is a first reading of a non-emergency ordinance. It moves to second reading. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Next item, please. Uh, item 764, a report. Except FY 2022-23 disbursement of Cannabis Emergency Relief Fund report. Commissioner Rubio. Thank you, Mayor. In December of 2021, Council approved in a historic 5-0 vote to provide a one-time allocation of $1.33 million from the Recreational Cannabis Tax Revenue and Cannabis Emergency Relief Fund Funds. These funds are, were available to struggling cannabis businesses and its workers that were economically impacted from the unprecedented COVID-19 pandemic, vandalism seen from um, the civil uh, state of unrest, increased criminal activity, and a historical 2020 wildfire season, and the residual effects of illness, trauma, and grief suffered from such impacts. 
The approval of these funds allowed Portland to become the first government jurisdiction in the country to provide emergency relief to cannabis businesses and its workers. And due to the great success witnessed in fiscal year 21-22 and the continued need for emergency relief in fiscal year 22-23, Council approved another one-time allocation of $456,000. The report being presented today is a record of the results of that disbursement. So Christina Corsi, the Cannabis Program Coordinator and others have joined us here to present this report. Thank you. Good morning, Mayor Wheeler and Commissioners of Council. My name is Christina Corsi and I'm the Supervisor of the Cannabis and Liquor Programs with Development Services. I come before you today to present the outcome of the fiscal year 22-23 disbursement of the Cannabis Emergency Relief Fund or better known as SURF. <clears throat> Next slide, please. In November 2016, Portland voters approved ballot measure 26-180 to impose a 3% local tax taken at the point of cannabis retail sales. Since then, over $30 million, that slide says 14 million, it is actually 30 million in cannabis tax revenue has been allocated across various city of Portland bureaus to support street infrastructure improvements, DUI training, drug rehabilitation, criminal justice, expungement and reentry services, and small businesses disproportionately impacted by cannabis prohibition. Prior to July 1st, 2023, the cannabis program was housed with the Office of Community and Civic Life. The licensing and compliance arm of the program has since moved to development services, while the social equity and educational development or SEED initiatives grant program moved to Prosper Portland. Seed Initiatives receives an ongoing allocation of $1.9 million from cannabis tax revenue to distribute funding across a range of pro projects, programs, and services within designated priority service areas of education development, social justice, entrepreneurship, and economic development. A budget of $5.8 million for Reimagine Oregon to support small businesses and economic prosperity for the black community also transferred to Prosper. For this presentation, I will only be specifically speaking about the Cannabis Emergency Relief Fund and will defer any questions about SEED or Reimagine Oregon to Prosper Portland. Next slide, please. SURF was developed in fiscal year 21-22 to provide emergency relief in the form of grants of up to $25,000 to small licensed cannabis businesses and up to $5,000 to cannabis industry workers economically impacted from the COVID-19 pandemic. Vandalism seen from the state of civil unrest experienced across the nation, increased criminal activity, impacts from the historic 2020 Oregon wildfires and the residual effects of illness, trauma, and grief suffered from such impacts. Throughout this presentation, I will cover the history and objectives of SURF. I will discuss the application process and provide demographics from the funding. You will hear from the ongoing, you will hear the ongoing challenges the cannabis industry continues to face and we will hear from our SURF community partners on their experiences as those who worked directly with cannabis business owners and its workers on disbursement of funds. Next slide, please. In March 2020, Oregon Governor Kate Brown declared a state of emergency due to concerns around the COVID-19 pandemic and issued an executive stay-at-home order. This order closed schools and many businesses that were considered non-essential. Cannabis businesses were fortunately deemed essential and were able to continue operating, although unfortunately, open for business made the cannabis industry employees vulnerable to contracting coronavirus. Employees with small children being forced out of the workforce or needing to take a reduction in hours in order to stay home with their children due to a lack of childcare and needing to homeschool. These cash-based businesses were also vulnerable to what would become a 115% increase in violent crime reported from the previous year and vandalism seen around the city and country. As time progressed, the distress felt by the cannabis industry only worsened. In early September 2020, rapid expansion of multiple wildfires ran rampant across the state, <clears throat> making the Oregon 2020 wildfire season one of the most destructive on record. Oregon wildfires have, <clears throat> have caused unprecedented devastation to the entire cannabis industry supply chain with significant uncertainty surrounding future outcomes and long-term sustainability. On December 1st, 2021, I presented before this council on fiscal year 21-22 
surf ordinance, which is widely accepted and provided $1.33 million allocated from the city's recreational cannabis tax revenue fund. We received a historic 5-0 vote from council, which allowed Portland to become the first government jurisdiction in the country to provide emergency relief to cannabis business and its workers. These funds were prioritized for historically disadvantaged populations, which includes minority women and veteran owned and those businesses qualifying as a small business. And they are based on the, <clears throat> they are dispersed on the level of need. Due to ongoing need, council approved a second one-time allocation of $456,901 in the fiscal year 22-23 budget. This funding included approximately 306,000 from of a one-time allocation of cannabis tax revenue and approximately 151,000 of one-time general fund resources. I spent the greater part of six months researching and developing the approved comprehensive plan for SURF that outlined all the eligibility requirements for businesses and individuals in the actual application for relief funding. Details of SURF were derived from assessing the needs of the industry, analyzing data trends, researching successful small business relief programs locally and across the country, and speaking with cannabis industry advocates. Next slide, please. As part of the historic 5-0 vote, council approved the proposed execution plan, including non-competitive umbrella grant agreements with three uniquely positioned organizations to manage applications and disperse funds. Due to the emergency nature of the funds, we propose these non-competitive grant agreements with organizations with proven historical experience with knowledge of and direct ac access to the very specific and unique target, target population. The, organi the organizations selected as community partners are all led by historically disadvantaged populations. So not only are the recipients being prioritized, so are the community partners dispersing the funds. SURF was modeled after an umbrella grant agreement that was made effective in December 2020 between the City of Portland and CAUSA of Oregon, which is the Oregon Reliefers Relief Fund that provided $1.7 million for unemployment-like benefits for those who cannot access state and federal unemployment benefits. Cannabis businesses are also in, un in a unique position as they are also not eligible for relief funding or federal funding due to cannabis still being classified as a Schedule I controlled substance and federally illegal. In fiscal year 21-22, City of Portland Cannabis Program worked with three uniquely selected community partners for the administration of these funds. Uh, the community partners received up to 20% admin fee. The admin fee was for marketing, outreach, intake, processing, verification, payment, and reporting of SURF. Uh, the community organizations we worked with were New Project, The Initiative, and Oregon Cannabis Association. New Project also acted as a fiscal sponsor to Cannabis Workers Coalition to provide grants to cannabis industry workers. The community partners selected were not being funded by SURF. They dispersed these funds to assist with a level of need that is harming cannabis businesses and will eventually put them out of business if we were to continue on the same direct trajectory. Due to the lower allocation received in fiscal year 22-23, the cannabis program only worked directly with the lead surf partner, New Project, to dis disperse these funds. And once again, New Project asked it, acted as a fiscal sponsor to Oregon Cannabis, cannabis Workers Coalition. Next slide, please. Just to provide a brief overview of business, business eligibility, while this is not an exhaustive list, I wanted to point out just a few. The businesses must be located in Portland city limits. They must be in good standing with the City of Portland Cannabis Program and OLCC. Uh, be 51% 51, 51 historically disadvantaged owned. Again, this includes minority owned, women owned, or veteran owned, or be considered a small business by holding three or less pending or active marijuana regulatory licenses by OLCC and have an annual combined total revenue of less than $2 million. They also must be in current in good standing with local, state, and applicable federal taxing and licensing authorities. Next slide, please. On this slide, you will see a list of eligible expenses that the SURF funds may be used for. Again, this is not an exhaustive list. I am only highlighting a few of them. These funds can be used for rent or mortgage payments, maintenance and repairs needed to restore premise following from damage of vandalism or break-in, <coughs> increased security measures. This does not include armed security guards or purchase of firearms or other weapons, 
expenses to cover medical trauma or grief counseling associated with COVID, robberies, or wildfire, and the cost to cover past due balances of marijuana regulatory licenses in order to remain in compliance. Next slide, please. The first SURF applications opened up on February 1st, 2022, and due to an overwhelming demand, application acceptance was paused after only 23 days. The total amount of funds requested in that 23 days was $2.1 million. The amount of total funds available after deducting the, the administrative overhead cost was approximately $1.1 million. There were many businesses still in emergency need that were unable to receive funding within the first round. However, with the amount of funding available and with the number of applications submitted, 91% of cannabis workers requesting relief were funded, while 70% of businesses um, had a funding rate. 35% of eligible applications were women-owned, while 52% of applications met new projects priority designation of black, Latino, or indigenous-owned businesses. These communities are known to have been most disproportionately harmed by cannabis prohibition. For fiscal year 22-23, applications opened on January 16th, 2023, and in order to increase equitable access, they remained open for a preset designated time of one month before closing. In those 30 days, there were approximately 1.8 million requested and only 391,000 available for dispersal. 77% of businesses that submitted an application were eligible and received funding while 99% of individuals received a portion of funding. 15% uh, of these businesses were women-owned, while 32% were BIPOC-owned. Next slide, please. As of August 2023, the cannabis industry is still reeling in hardship and continued increased criminal activity. Data obtained by OLCC indicates 300 Portland cannabis businesses reported theft of product and or cash between February 2020 and August 2023. Portland accounts for 69.1% of thefts statewide. Some businesses being victimized more than once. These thefts range from looting to armed robbery, some resulting in bodily injury, sexual assault, and even homicide. Updated stats received for this month shows two reported thefts already in September. Further data obtained from OLCC indicates the economic, the Oregon cannabis economy is the lowest it has been since 2015. Coupled with the economic ramifications from increased crime, increased overhead with the cost of doing business, including rent hikes, wage increases, general inflation costs, and the inability to deduct usual business tax expenses, a perfect, a perfect storm is being generated and is threatening the livelihood and success of Portland's small cannabis businesses many of which are choosing to sell or are temporarily closing the doors to decrease, decrease continual expenses from repeated vandalism and robberies. In the past year, the cannabis program has seen a record number of licensed surrenders and door store closures. Next slide, please. Next, we will hear testimony from the community organizations uh, that the cannabis program partnered with to manage the fiscal year 22-23 SURF applications and disperse funds to those most in need. I would like to introduce President and CEO of New Project, Jeanette Ward. Hi, hi, my name is Jeanette Ward. Thank you for the opportunity to give you testimony today. And um, I first just want to start off by saying that you may have noticed a few slides ago the stats around 14 million in cannabis taxes collected. And if you do the math, uh, over half of that is now going to the communities disproportionately harmed by the war on drugs. I just want to thank the commissioner for, for this commission for getting there. That has been some work that we've been doing and the community's been doing with you all over the last few years. And to see that on that slide is um, a real testament to advancement, I think, in progress in, in putting this money where voters wanted it to go, which was to um, economic recovery and resilience for the communities most harmed by the war on drugs. So first off, just backing up and doing a 10,000 foot view, we're moving really in the right direction in terms of how these cannabis taxes get reinvested um, and into repairing harm um, for the communities that were unduly and unfairly uh, arrested. So that said, let's talk about how these specific funds have gone to work this year uh, creating equity. This isn't just equity in terms of serving uh, the black, brown, and women-owned businesses who usually don't give funding. This is equity um, for the industry just and good business sense for a 
city. There aren't emergency relief funds available to these businesses. And when I dispersed these checks, handwritten and handed to these business owners, the 49 that you saw, we had conversations about, um, about their journey and their struggle as small business owners. They're um, on MLK with beautiful uh, cannabis dispensaries that, um, that they don't have the funds to do emergency repairs when there's a burglary, and they don't have the funds to continue to pay these employees when product is stolen, and now um, they don't know how they're gonna make ends meet this month because they literally had product walk out the door. These are um, businesses who, because they're small growing businesses, are the ones that are adding the most employees, uh, the most new growth in employees. So this is the kind of funding you want to do to a, an industry that has the potential for some serious long-term growth, but right now doesn't have the emergency relief funds to keep it on its feet. So these funds kept these businesses on their feet. They kept these employees employed. And I'll tell you that a, the other kind of um, largest use of these funds was on exterior improvements and safety. So making these businesses look better on the outside, but also look safer and be safer for the employees um, and the community, really adding security cameras and adding lights um, and keeping these businesses from being a target with security doors. So this is really just a smart use of funds, and it's um, a pleasure to share with you how these funds were used and, and to reiterate that, that these funds can't dry up. So as we've seen these, these taxes um, dwindle, we really, I would really urge you to see how you continue to think about this as a smart business investment for these small businesses who don't have any other way um, to get these funds. Um, so the state's, the state's not there with cannabis business funding, so the city and the county needs to be. So thank you for doing that. Thank you. Next slide, please. Thank you, Jeanette, for that testimony. I would like to welcome Sabina Monet, Founder and Executive Director of Cannabis Workers Coalition. Hello, everyone. Yes, thank you so much for allowing me to be here to testify. Um, I am the co-founder and executive director of a grassroots worker center that advocates for equitable labor practices in the cannabis industry. We've also been responsible for dispersing $200,000 of the SURF fund to 200 workers in the last two years. Um, I just want to speak more about the direct impact this has had on the individuals, the workers that serve this community. Workers such as um, Aileron, who's father of a six-year-old girl and after working in the industry for five years was held at gunpoint during a mass burglary. Uh, in July of 2020. As a man who needs to support his family, he had no choice but to return to work during a time when customers were mandated to wear masks, and because of this, suffered from PTSD and anxiety attacks while clocked in. Luckily, um, we were able to give him funds from the SURF grant, which allowed him to seek professional help, so he felt comfortable simply clocking into work. Um, there's also workers such as Elizabeth, a woman with a high-risk disability that was forced to leave her job after an employer would not make a reasonable accommodation to lessen her exposure to the coronavirus. Afterwards, they're unable to find a secure spot in the industry where they would feel safe coming into work and because of this fell behind on bills, rent, and car payments. Um, Luckily, again, we were able to grant them funds that allowed them to catch up on these payments, which would have saved them from losing their housing and transportation. Over the last two years, you may have heard at least four times the amount of funds granted to our organization has been requested from workers. We've had to reject applications simply because we ran out of money. There's clearly still a need for a SURF grant um, from workers. 75% of our funds went directly to the pockets of workers from the most impacted communities, with 60% of them being black and brown workers who were most at risk for evictions. Many of our applications were from individuals who had to miss work because they contracted COVID-19 or recovering from traumatic and sometimes violent uh, robberies that occurred in the workplace. In addition to that, these workers have been carrying debts for on average of six to nine months and were often at the brink of a total financial and emotional collapse. So um, I stand here before you on behalf of my organization and many of the Portland cannabis workers to request that you grant an additional round of emergency funding. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Sabina. Next slide, please. 
Portland cannabis, Portland, Portland based cannabis businesses continue to experience extreme financial impacts caused by increased continual criminal activity as well as market downturn. Despite being eight years into legalization, Portland's cannabis lands landscape is still young. Therefore, we must do what we can to provide assistance during the ebbs and flows, especially to struggling businesses during times of hardship in order to uplift and support small businesses historically disadvantaged and those disproportionately impacted by cannabis prohibition. There is absolutely an ongoing need to provide emergency relief to the cannabis industry. Unfortunately, due to the reorganization of civic life programs earlier this year, we were unable to request another one-time allocation of SURF. During an attempt to request funding during fall bump, I was told that fiscal year 22-23 cannabis tax revenue was already accounted for. However, the cannabis program continues to provide an equity-centered framework and will continue collaborating with partnering agencies and our community partners to provide resources and assistance where applicable with a funding request next fiscal year should it, there still be a need. Thank you for your time today. If you have any questions for either myself or our community partners, we will take those now. Very good. Thank you for the report. Colleagues, questions? Commissioner Rubio? I just have one thing I was uh, negligent in doing this uh, right before the presentation. Um, colleagues, uh, we need to, I need to make a motion to amend the report. There was a little bit of updated data in the presentation, so we just want to make sure it's trued up. Uh, nothing material, uh, materially different. Sure, I'll second. Any further discussion on the amendment? Call the roll on the amendment. Gonzalez. Aye. Maps. Aye. Rubio. Aye. Ryan. Aye. Wheeler. All right, the amendment's on the table, and I, I'm doing that prior to any public testimony because it's technical in nature. Uh, any further questions at this point? Uh, sure. Commissioner Ryan. First of all, Christina, thank you for your own resilience in the transition from uh, civic life to BDS. I want to know that I appreciate that. And it, it was necessary to remove the regulatory out of civic life so that mission could get back to focus. Um, and also, it's great to meet the partners just so I really do understand this. So it sounds like your, these two partners, you represent organizations, of course, distribute the funds. And then you're the regulatory in terms of the, the parameters, if you will. Correct. Okay. And then the way I'm taking it in is you're more focused on the small businesses. You care about them too, but you're more focused on the workers in those organizations, correct? Correct. Okay, great. Nothing's ever perfect, but I just have a couple questions on to hear stories on why there's a little bit of a gap between what was um, requested, or there's always a gap between what's requested and received, uh, but in what was delivered. So 83% went out the door in 21, 22, therefore 70% did not. I just wanna hear stories on what the, what's involved with that 70%. And then this fiscal year 22, 23, 14% of the money that you had didn't get out the door. There's a lot of people that are tuning into government right now when we say that we need more money and anytime there's a disparity between what we have and then what we're not getting out the door, people need to know why. So I just wanna hear the stories. There's always reasons. I'm not sure I follow the question. Um, we distributed all the money that was uh, allocated for distribution according to the contract. Was there an amount of tax money that didn't make it to us? So what we saw in the report was that um, in 21, 22, uh, there was 1.33 million that went out. Um, there was, um, or dispersed was 1.1, if you will, and what was received to go out was 1.33. So 83% went out, 70% did not. I just want to hear some stories on about why that 70 17% did go out. Yeah. And so that the, probably the, is for you, Christina. The yeah. approximately $200,000 that were not dispersed went to the administrative cost of dispersing those funds. Okay, see, that answered the question. And so therefore the administrative cost in 22, 23 were 14%? 17%. Okay, all right, thank you. Oh, and then because it's been in the news so often, I just wanna hear, uh, LaModa, are they, did they receive money this past year? N no. No. Okay, for the record, they did not. No, they, they okay. do not qualify as a historically uh, disadvantaged business, and they also do not qualify as um, a small business. And I'll just end with one more point. Earlier, we had some really compelling testimony about the small business classification. I don't know if you heard that, but it's, a, it's its own classification of struggle. And I think that you get at the crossroads of that. And so I think it is great that you're looking at, at really focusing on the challenge of being a small business, especially 
ones that don't have the same protections and regulations. So I wanna say I appreciate that. And I know there are many uh, small business owners in this space that want to be able to receive these awards. I think it was great that it moved to Prosper, who has a nimbleness around this. And I'm really grateful to see that progress being made. But I like the expansion of looking at all small businesses because they are all being impacted by this. Thanks. Do we have public testimony on this item? No one signed up. Could we take a two minute recess and we'll, we'll wait for Commissioner uh, Gonzalez to get back and then we'll take the vote. Thank you for the report. We're in Thank recess you. for two minutes. Maps. Hi. Rubio. Um, I just want to thank Christina and Jeanette and Sabina for their presentations today. Um, it's a very important program uh, for our small cannabis uh, businesses and their workers. And in this time of uncertainty, it's really important for the city to step, be stepping up and supporting these small businesses. Uh, it's clear the industry is struggling, uh, and we need to continue these conversations. And I'm glad for it. I vote aye. Ryan. Aye. Wheeler. Good report, appreciate it. I vote aye, the report is accepted, thank you. Next item please, 765. Accept 2022 annual report by the Cannabis Policy Oversight Team. Commissioner Rubio. Thank you. The Cannabis po Policy Oversight Committee, CPOT, is an advisory body uh, created by the city to facilitate dialogue between industry representatives, cannabis workers, consumers, public health workers, and the broader community. CPOT meets to discuss issues affecting and, effect, uh, affecting and affected by cannabis since the legalization of the adult use market. This advisory body and its subcommittees meet frequently to discuss ongoing issues, conduct research, build community, and make recommendations to policymakers and regulators. CPOT and its subcommittees hold regular meetings online that are open to the public. The 2022 CPOT annual report unveiled key findings that have existed in the Portland cannabis market and beyond. It highlighted the need to increase data collection and study the impacts of cannabis to allow for data-informed policy. Also, the industry faces significant barriers to success that are not present, present in other businesses due to federal prohibitions and other challenges, and there's a need to increase efforts towards environmental sustainability. The stakeholder partners of CPOT and the cannabis program include Pro Prosper Portland, the Oregon Liquor and Cannabis Commission, Portland City Council, and Oregon Health Authority, Multnomah County Health Department, cannabis industry workers, business owners, consumers, parents of youth, and neighbors. Ongoing community involvement is necessary to ensure enactment of policy recommendations, research, and transparency cross-bureau collaboration, monitoring of policy and impacts, feedbacks, feedback, and open conversations about cannabis. The 2022 annual report builds on some previous recommendations and give clear, gives clear calls to action for policymakers and regulators to support needed changes in the adult use cannabis industry. So I'd now like to hand it to, to Phil Keem, Cannabis Policy Coordinator at BDS, to present this report. Thank you. All right, thank you. Uh, good morning. For the record, my name is Phil Keim, uh, Policy Coordinator for the Bureau of Development Services Cannabis Program. Um, and good morning, Mayor Wheeler and Commissioners. It's uh, nice to meet you in this space. Um, <clears throat> and I want to thank you for allowing us the time to share the Cannabis Policy Oversight Team's 2022 annual report. Uh, I'm pleased to meet you all in this space and, and honored to work for the city over the last few months and my colleagues at the city uh, our partner organizations and other agencies uh, and volunteers uh, on this advisory committee uh, who come from the community, the cannabis industry, and public health have worked hard to establish Portland as a leader in the cannabis uh, uh, policy world that rights the wrongs of the war on drugs and engages community uh, into the changes that we make along the way. Um, I'm happy to be a part of this team and, and look forward to continuing to bring 
more uh, successful programs and efforts here in Portland uh, and beyond. Um, a 2020 audit uh, of the cannabis program found that to be effective, we need to report on progress to inform needed adjustments to the strategy and respond to evolving industry. And so bringing these updates today uh, just allows us to meet the need for ongoing communication and adjustments uh, in the way that our program works with the industry. Perfect. Um, so just going over our agenda here really quickly, uh, today is just an opportunity to give an update of the work completed by the Cannabis Policy Oversight Team, also known as CPOT. Um, last year, that led to the 2022 annual report. Um, we'll share some background on the annual report, uh, who worked on it, uh, the process of how it was written, the framework used, key findings, uh, and finally, the policy recommendations proposed by community members. CPOT is an advisory body created on December 17th, 2015 by the former commissioner in charge of the Office of Community and Civic Life, uh, formerly Office of Neighborhood Involvement, and then effective April 1st, uh, the cannabis program which provides the liaisons, uh, myself and my co colleagues, uh, to work with CPOT. Uh, we were moved over to BDS uh, following approval of an ordinance from the city council. And so the body uh, provides the Bureau of Development Services with diverse stakeholder perspectives on cannabis-related public policies and the team's objectives are to discuss and develop policies that support equitable access and outcomes for the cannabis industry, cannabis consumers, and all City of Portland residents. Next slide, please. Um, the volunteers listed here, some of whom are no longer members of CPOT, uh, completed the work last year that led to the 2022 annual report. Are we on the right slide? Sorry, next. Yes, this one here. Oh, uh, got it. Thank you. Thanks. Um, these volunteers uh, were members of the CPOT last year. Some of them continue uh, in, as members now, but uh, not all of them. Um, and they completed the work that led to the 2022 Anna Report uh, with some support from my colleagues uh, who are at the city now and other city workers who have also moved on to other work. And next slide, please. Over the course of last calendar year, uh, the Cannabis Policy Oversight Team and its subcommittees met to discuss ongoing issues affecting and affected by the cannabis industry uh, in the Portland sorry, community. Can I ask a question about the last slide? Yeah. Uh, are there any members that are actually owners of the small business cannabis operations? I believe so. Um, uh, of those, I think uh, Brett Bourne, is a, a business owner, um, Derek Smith, Public Health, Hannah Hohendorf, Public Health, uh, Natalie Darvis uh, works in, in cannabis as well. Um, yeah. So the percentage is small, but there are people that have lived experience working in the cannabis industry yes. in terms of a small business, like we were talking about earlier? For sure. Okay. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Sure. Um, actually, let me jump in here. Finish your maps. Actually, I'll pass. Okay. Um, CPOT and its subcommittee members uh, conducted research and led outreach to experts from the cannabis industry, from public health. Um, they spoke with policymakers and regulators. Um, and the annual report last year is a summary of findings and recommendations to enact policies that strengthen economic, environmental, human, and social equity. And shaping can future cannabis policies involves a collaborative effort between policymakers, industry stakeholders, public health experts, and community members. And CPOT recognizes the following key steps that can be taken to shape future policies uh, to conduct research and gather data. It's essential to conduct local research on the effects of cannabis use on public health, public safety, and the economy. And policymakers should also gather data on the experiences of other jurisdictions that have legalized cannabis to inform policy decisions. Um, to engage stakeholders, policymakers should engage with a diverse group of stakeholders, including industry representatives, public health experts, law enforcement officials, and community members to ensure that all perspectives are considered when developing policies. I think CPOT's a, a perfect place for these conversations to be had. Um, develop regulations. Clear regulations are essential to ensure that the cannabis industry operates safely and responsibly. Regulation should cover all aspects of the industry, including cultivation, processing, distribution, and retail sales. Promote equity. Policies should uh, be developed with equity in mind, particularly in communities that have been disproportionately affected by cannabis prohibition. And this can involve measures such as expunging past uh, cannabis-related convictions and creating opportunities for individuals from underserved communities 
to participate in the legal cannabis industry. And finally, uh, provide education and public awareness. It's important to educate the public about the risks and benefits of cannabis use, particularly among young people and young adults. Um, public awareness campaigns could also help to reduce the stigma associated with cannabis use. And next slide, please. Commissioner Ryan, did you yeah, want to Phil, on that last on? slide question, sure. we, the last report we heard about the economic hardship of so many in the industry right now, and I'm looking at the key buckets here. Which one would fall into that category? I suppose for promoting equity, uh, economic equity. If we, in fact, look at the big picture equity that includes small businesses, perhaps. But I think my feedback would be that was the majority of the last presentation. And so then I don't see anything that really targets that when it comes to our future policy. So just feedback. Sure. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, I thought it was important to highlight the framework used in this annual report. Um, yesterday in a, a training, uh, it was pointed out that it's important to have shared meaning, um, especially when we use words like equity um, that are in our core values. Um, so CPOT uh, chose to use this holistic meaning of the word equity to frame cannabis policy recommendations and ideas. Uh, and the idea is to get our community closer to total health equity by addressing these different pillars uh, within the capital E equity word. So um, this is the Cannabis Health Equity Movement, or CHEM, which was created by former CPOT member and uh, uh, Dr. Rachel Knox. Um, CHEM is a call to educate, advocate, and demonstrate uh, that cannabis is a core solution to achieving health, health equity for all people, beginning with communities most divested of access to full health and well-being. And CHEM asserts that social equity is our vehicle while health equity is our destination. And we believe that health equity should be the true north of not only the <coughs> cannabis industry, but for all governments, public and private sector institutions, and individuals as we imagine and create more prosperous societies for all people. And we can go to the next slide. So these were the key findings that the advisory body found uh, in writing this annual report last year. Um, and they directed the subcommittee's focus on economic, educational, and research opportunities in the broader Portland community. Um, number one, a, a lack of local data and research hinders progress toward more effective, sustainable, and equitable cannabis policy. Um, number two, significant work remains undone to address ongoing racial disparities and inequity within the industry. And key finding number three, small businesses uh, need local government support for technical assistance, uh, workforce development, increases in safety measures, and other resources. <laughs> we can go to the next slide. So these are the four uh, recommendations uh, made by the Cannabis Policy Oversight Team in their annual report last year. Um, so recommendation number one, to amend and modify the current license fee reduction program to help small cannabis businesses and those directly impacted by cannabis prohibition. In 2018, the City Council approved the creation of a license fee reduction program to help small cannabis businesses and those directly impacted by cannabis prohibition. And the license fee <coughs> reduction program provides 15 to 25% off the cost of the annual license to qualifying businesses in the following areas. Uh, qualifying as a small business, owners or staff with previous cannabis convictions, uh, or contracting goods and services with minority owned, women owned, or small emerging businesses, uh, or those producers and processes that sign up uh, for early assistance appointment for related permitting. We like to build this program out more to provide further incentives to the industry. Um, currently, we have 367 active licenses um, and have 56 licenses enrolled in the license fee reduction program, which save these businesses a combined $28,000, give or take. Um, in 2018, a small cannabis business was defined as a business earning less than $750,000 uh, in annual total income. And since then, the threshold for small businesses to access this uh, program have not been adjusted to better align with the uh, current uh, climate, um, uh, 280E tax burdens, uh, commercial lease prices, or the movement towards paying a livable wage and offering benefits to employees. Um, so CPOT's call to action is to increase the gross annual income threshold to $2 million, uh, to offer fee reduction to businesses paying one and a quarter times the minimum wage, and to offer fee reduction to businesses providing health care benefits at 80% to employees. And we're looking at possibly other incentives, incentives um, and plan to take this ordinance to council in the next couple of months. Um, so any feedback from you all is welcome. Um, next slide. 
Recommendation number two uh, is to create a new category of license fee reduction opportunities for cannabis businesses that pursue specific sustainability goals that align with the city's strategic plan for a sustainable future. Um, CPOT recommends implementing a scalable program for cultivators that starts with an energy audit and ends with maximum efficiency. An energy audit uh, might include an inspection of buildings, processes, and equipment to analyze energy consumption and identify efficiency uh, improvements to reduce a business's energy use and costs. Uh, CPOT recommends license fee reduction for any indoor cultivator that has completed an energy audit within the last calendar year of license issuance. Um, and when these programs are successful, progressive additions could be made to encourage businesses to continue with efficiency improvements. And these improvements uh, would be monitored by the city's cannabis compliance specialists. Uh, CPOT also recommends offering a license fee reduction for any retail store that has adopted a city-approved waste management plan, which includes accepting recyclable packaging. Uh, this program would require benchmarking current rates for waste, recycling, and more, and showing changes in rates of diversion and collection of consumer recyclable packaging annually. The next slide, please. Recommendation number three, uh, CPOT requests the Oregon Liquor and Cannabis Commission, or OLCC, to, re to review and change its educational materials to reflect how the industry is operating today. And while indeed CPOT was created uh, to advise the city bureau in charge of the cannabis program, it's essential that this group has conversations and presents ideas to policymakers and regulators uh, beyond city limits. Uh, because of the complicated web of can cannabis policy from Federal, state, and local perspectives, CPOT addresses topics uh, from our community and beyond with every conversation that they have. So recommendation number three's audience is the OLCC um, and requests changes to their marijuana worker permit education program, which was created after the passage of Measure 91. And since then, there have been considerable changes uh, in the operating procedures of the industry and the terminology used, uh, and their real concerns for safety and customer relations in the cannabis industry. And while Oregon is a trailblazing uh, in its requirement for all cannabis workers to receive education and pass a test to obtain a marijuana worker's permit, the contents of this education are out of date or incorrect with the cannabis uh, industry as it exists today. Um, so CPOT calls on OLCC to change some terminology in their materials to reflect uh, current generally accepted terminology. Um, for example, changing any instance of the word marijuana to cannabis, changing recreational to adult use, um, and CPOD recommends adding units on consumer health, customer relations, and worker safety. On July 20th of this year, CPOD members Christina uh, and myself attended an OLCC commissioner's meeting uh, to present this recommendation. Natalie Darvis from CPOD gave a great explanation of the work that informed this perspective, and she fielded questions from commissioners. And they were generally pretty receptive to our, our call to action here uh, for some modest reforms um, and gave us some direction. You know, because they hear from uh, a wide variety of stakeholders. They have to ensure that the policies they adopt are in the best interest of all parties. Um, so they asked us to return with support from a broader coalition of trade organizations and advisory groups to follow up on our request with consensus from other groups that can inform the uh, proper steps are followed through changes in statute in the coming years, the legislature, uh, and through their rules advisory committees. Uh, and we can go to the next slide, please. And finally, recommendation number four, um, CPOT requests that the City of Portland establish a policy to solicit public feedback regarding youth in the cannabis industry every three to five years. Um, in partnership with the seed initiatives at Prosper, uh, this report would be used to better inform where cannabis tax revenue should be used to impact youth education about cannabis. Throughout last year, the Community Impact Subcommittee of CPOT reviewed data from student health surveys, the Oregon Poison Control Reports, uh, and a dispensary sa staff survey they completed. Um, with the focus on youth, the subcommittee members identified a lack of information regarding the impact of the cannabis industry on young people in Portland uh, through public health campaigns, cannabis advertising, uh, and perceptions of, youth, uh, perceptions of use among youth and adults. Um, so this subcommittee recommended soliciting feedback and data collection from the Portland area community every three to five years uh, beginning next fiscal year. We can go to the last slide. Um, thank you all for your attention uh, and, and support of our work to improve conditions for the cannabis industry uh, and folks impacted by the legalization of cannabis. Um, I'd welcome any questions from you all and, and also mention my contact information here uh, on this slide so uh, members of the public are, are welcome to 
ask me questions, uh, provide any feedback as well to the work that this <coughs> advisory body works on. So thank you very thank much. You. Commissioner Ryan. Oh, my hand was still up. Uh, two things. One is you brought up youth. I just wanted to hear about the engagement with our with the schools on that topic. Sure. Uh, this advisory body and subcommittee has reviewed some uh, youth risk behavior survey data this year, um, just understanding the trends of uses of cannabis um, and other substances um, among area youth. So that's a, a CDC administered survey um, that was collected, I think, four years ago and then a year <coughs> ago. Um, and they'll be rolling that out again. So we had some folks from PPS come and uh, speak to the community members of this advisory body uh, about that survey, um, areas of need in that survey. Um, there's a question about access, where youth are getting cannabis from that was removed from that survey. Um, so some community members feel that that question should probably go back into the survey to inform it. In that, in that space, there's a lot of opinions and heated opinions even on this topic. And being in that, coming from that area, I just wanted to make sure that they were a part of building those questions. Certainly. Um, and just a factoid, when we were looking at trades and really trying to get more of our youth um, to see that as an option, you know, a lot of times the only options that are presented to them is college and military or good luck in retail. And one of the best um, avenues, of course, is to go into the trades where you have living wage jobs the rest of your life. And there's two factors that were making that challenging for some to get into apprenticeship programs. Math is one, of course, that makes sense. You have to be highly skilled with math. And the other was weed because of the, the test that's at the federal level. So just had to get that out. In your executive summary, you mentioned um, that there were challenges uh, getting data. Could you talk more about that? Yeah, well, one of the pieces of data that um, this advisory body has called for is just more of a line item reporting of cannabis tax dollars. So instead of seeing that cannabis tax dollars go into the general fund, you know, this, the community members are, are hopeful that there can be an increase in transparency to know exactly where uh, cannabis dollars might go. Um, another piece of data is uh, about crime st statistics. Yeah. Um, locally here in Portland, you know, we have data from the OLCC about uh, instances of crime at cannabis businesses. Um, and there hasn't been a, a, a concentrated collection of data in Portland um, for a report. But I am happy to report that um, I've been working with Portland Police Bureau on this, um, and they, their crime analyst team has come close. Uh, their report is almost finished. Uh, they analyze this data going back all the way to, I think, 2016 when adult use cannabis was legalized. Um, so these, they've looked at trends in uh, reports of theft and vandalism and robbery at cannabis businesses. Um, so I think that report should be coming out hopefully very soon um, and reveals some, some key insights about when uh, crimes are occurring, exactly where they're occurring, uh, and frequency at different businesses. Okay, great. I wanted to hear more about that, so thanks. And I know that all of us up here would like to work with you to eliminate those roadblocks so that you have access to the data that's necessary to great. make good decisions. Yeah, thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? Public testimony on this report? No one signed up. I'll entertain a motion. So moved. Second. Commissioner Maps moves to accept the report. Commissioner Ryan seconds any further discussion on the report. Seeing none, please call the roll. Gonzalez. Aye. Maps. Aye. Rubio. I want to thank you, Phil, for that really informative presentation and all your great work on it. Um, this gives us really clear recommendations to track as you move forward on your progress, and we look forward to hearing it. I vote aye. Ryan. Yeah, Phil, thank you for this report. And please know my questioning is because it's really important that we continue to build this industry right. I always said our number one cash crop, we're, we're receiving the revenue that we should from it. Now we have to make sure that we do it right here in Portland throughout the state. And so we have to keep leaning in, asking tough questions to make sure that this is part of an economic development strategy as well. So I vote aye. Wheeler. All right, the report is accepted. Thank you. Thank you all very much. Item number 766, please, a proclamation. Proclaim September 2023 to be Childhood Cancer Awareness Month. <laughs> Colleagues, our next item is a proclamation naming September 2023 to be Childhood Cancer Awareness Month. I'd like to welcome Dr. Stephen Roberts, who's the Division Head of Pediatric Hematology and Oncology at the OHSU Knight Cancer Institute to present this proclamation. Good morning. Good morning. Thank you. Mm 
You go ahead and start. <laughs> Sorry. Sorry, okay. Are we waiting for uh, some slides to come up? No, we're not. Okay, uh, very good. My hesitation there was because I was under the impression that you were re someone was reading the proclamation that I was speaking after it, so I don't oh, actually have um, the proclamation in front of me. Oh, well, we, why don't I do that then? Um, I apologize. We, we can I, do this I misunderstood how like this went. This is my, so, this is my so, first uh, time here, so I'm, I'm oh, learning good. as we go. Well, we're glad to have you, well, first of all. Here. So Thank why don't so I read the proclamation? Thank you. And then maybe when I'm done with the proclamation, we can hear from you. Perfect. And then we'll let my colleagues speak, and maybe I'll have some wrap-up words, and we'll do it that way. How does that sound? That sounds wonderful. Thank right. you. And we're, we're really glad that you're here I'm glad this morning. So here is the proclamation, and I want to uh, thank you and your colleagues for the assistance in drafting this proclamation, and I want to thank my colleagues as well. This is a proclamation on behalf of us and, by extension, the city. Whereas the American Cancer Fund for Children and Kids Cancer Connection Report, cancer is the leading cause of death by disease among U.S. children between infancy and age 15. This tragic disease is detected in more than 16,000 of our country's young people. Every year, an estimated 400,000 children, this happened last year too, An estimated 400,000 children and adolescents are diagnosed with cancer globally each year. And whereas one in five of our nation's children loses their battle with cancer. This may take a little longer, but we're going to get through it because it's important. Whereas one in five of our nation's children loses their battle with cancer, many infants, children, and teens will suffer from the long-term effects of comprehensive treatment, including secondary cancers. Can I help you out? I'm determined. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. I do appreciate the offer. I am determined. Whereas the early diagnosis of childhood cancer is often hampered by nonspecific symptoms shared by common childhood conditions. And whereas childhood cancer impacts the physical, emotional, and financial health of the entire family for years to come. And whereas Founded nearly 30 years ago by Stephen Firestein, a member of the philanthropic branch of the Max Factor Cosmetics family, the American Cancer Fund for Children Incorporated, Kids Cancer Connection Incorporated, along with Lions Club International are dedicated to helping these children and their families. And whereas the American Cancer Fund for Children and Kids Cancer Connection provide a variety of vital patient psychological services to children undergoing cancer treatment at Randall Children's Hospital at Legacy Emanuel, OHSU's Dornbecker Children's Hospital, and Shriners Children's Portland, Ronald McDonald House Charities of Oregon and Southwest Washington, as well as participating hospitals throughout the country, thereby enhancing the quality of life for these children and their families. And whereas the American Cancer Fund for Children and Kids Cancer Connection also sponsor toy distributions, family sailing programs, KCC supercar experience, laughter noon, laughter is healing, pet assisted therapy, home and hospital instructional programs, and hospital celebrations in honor of a child's determination and bravery. To fight their battle against childhood cancer. And whereas the state's premier academic health center 
including OHSU Knight Cancer Institute and Dornbecker Children's Hospital, have distinguished themselves in research and patient care in both adult and pediatric cancer cases and have contribute, contributed significantly to the overall understanding of these diseases and their management. And whereas too many children are affected by this deadly disease and more must be done to raise awareness and find a cure. Now therefore, I, Ted Wheeler, Mayor of the City of Portland, Oregon, the City of Roses, do hereby proclaim September 2023 to be Childhood Cancer Awareness Month in Portland and encourage all residents to observe this month. The wording of this proclamation is important. We mean it deeply. My delivery was not up to par. I've set a low bar for you. Um, why don't we hear from you next and then we'll hear from my colleagues. Thank you for being here. Thank you, Mary Wood. I really appreciate you reading that. Thank you. Um, as uh, just to introduce myself again, my name is Dr. Stephen Roberts. I have the privilege of serving as the head of the Division of Pediatric Hematology and Oncology at Dornbecker Children's Hospital at OHSU. I'm also the Associate Director for Pediatric um, Oncology um, of the Knight Cancer Institute at OHSU and a professor of pediatrics there. Um, I'm really, really grateful for the opportunity to be here and uh, for this proclamation, and so thank you all for that. Um, as I start, I would specifically like to acknowledge that anybody that may be present today, whether in person or online, who may be walking this road, who may be facing or has faced um, childhood cancer, this is, this, it is hard. And, and I, I want you all to know that we're aware of you, that, that we care about you, that we are here to help you and you're not alone. So childhood cancer. For some listening today, for some here today, you probably didn't even know this was a thing. Kids get cancer? Well, yes. Yes, in fact, they do. As you just heard in the proclamation, child is the number one disease, childhood cancer is the number one disease killer of children in America today. It claims the lives of more kids than any other disease in America. Now, that's not to imply that other diseases are not also tragic or important, but it does highlight the need for proclamations such as this and the awareness of this very real problem that we face. But what does it really mean when I say it's the number one disease killer? What does that actually look like? Let me put this it this way. Imagine for a second with me a classroom full of children, okay? Think about an average size classroom full of kids, 20, 25, 30 kids. Well, an average size classroom full of kids will die from cancer today and tomorrow, and every day, all year long, this year and next year. That's, that's what it really looks like. Think about, say, a first grade classroom in an elementary school nearby. Think about those kids full of life, promise, potential, excitement. It's gone. Tomorrow, picture that next class. Gone. I just want to let that sink in for a minute. But I'm not here just to be uh, negative and it's all doom and gloom. Um, the reality is we've made incredible progress in, taking, in, in treating children with cancer. Childhood leukemias, the most common form of cancer uh, in children, was 100% fatal in the 1960s. It was a death sentence. If you were lucky, you got a couple of months before your child died. Today, the most common subtype called standard risk acute lymphoblastic leukemia, that's not the important part. The point is it's the most common cancer we see, is cured 95% of the time. And when I say cured, I mean cured. I don't mean in remission, but it's probably gonna come back someday. I mean gone for good forever. Those kids are gonna grow up and go on and become adults. And I think that's amazing, and that's another thing that when we talk about childhood cancer awareness that we all need to be aware of, that we actually do cure today a lot of these kids. Um, something I'm proud to have been a part of in my career, and it's something exciting that we're doing. But that said, it's not all even. While some forms of leukemia have been a huge triumph, other childhood cancers have not seen this progress. There are many other cancers in kids where very few survive despite aggressive treatments, chemotherapy, radiation, surgery. And those who do survive are often left with lifelong disabilities and health problems. Now, why is that? Well. We could go on for hours, and I won't, um, but there's a lot of reasons for that. 
But one important reason that I would like to highlight is that because today in 2023, less than 4% of the National Cancer Institute's budget goes to fund research and treatment into childhood cancer. And so you can imagine that makes our job a lot harder. Um, and again, highlights the importance of raising awareness of this important problem that our kids face. You know, over the past 40 years, years fewer than 10 new drugs have been approved to treat kids with cancer. Um, to put that in context, that's fewer than the FDA has already approved this year alone for adult cancer. So while it's unfortunate, this is, I think, another key important fact that as we talk about childhood cancer awareness, that we are aware of the challenges that we face in funding and researching this disease. A few years ago, I received a card in the mail, kind of out of the blue. It was from the mother of a patient I took care of at OHSU 22 years ago. We diagnosed this little child at three months of age, and she had a particularly rare and nasty cancer that had sort of invaded the entire one side of her chest. There was no way you could do surgery, you couldn't do radiation in a three-month-old baby, so we gave her chemotherapy. It was all we had, and as you can imagine, that's not an easy thing to do in a three-month-old, and, and I'll be honest with you, I did not expect her to survive, and by all accounts, she should not have, but she did. And this card that I received was from the mom letting me know that she had graduated from high school and that she was soon to go off to college. And she acknowledged that she had disabilities and challenges because of her treatment and her cancer, but she wanted me to know that she was alive, and not just alive, but thriving. And, and I have been privileged to take care of kids like that for my entire career, and I'm grateful for that opportunity. And so as I close today, what I would, if I could be so bold, what I would say is that while awareness is important, it's the critical first step, it's not enough. And my hope today is that some, someone listening that someone would, would hear about this and be moved to move from awareness to action. Because alone, we can't do this. But with help from others, together, we can. And I firmly believe that we will end childhood cancer. Mm -hmm. And so I thank you for your attention and for your proclamation. Commissioner Maps, can, can, can you let me get one question Absolutely. in here? So uh, action in your mind looks like what? When you say, let's, let's move away from awareness towards action, if, if you, you know, looking back on your career, if you have a top one or two or three wishes about where we go in terms of action, what, what would you say? That's a great question, thank you. Um, so for me, action has been research. It's, I, I take care of patients, I do research, and action is understanding the disease is better, it's, it's advocating for a better and improved funding to, to study these diseases. I think for the average person who's not a physician, who's not a pediatric oncologist, I think there's so many ways that people can be involved, whether that's simply being a volunteer up at Dornbecker, coming to 10 South and spending time with these kids, you know, and helping these families. It's an incredibly difficult time. And we take care of patients from all over, from all of Oregon, Southwest Washington. We get patients from Northern California. These people are far from home. They need help and support. So something as simple as volunteering there are many, as you heard about the proclamation, there are many outstanding foundations that are doing really great work. You know, contacting one of them and joining and helping those as they raise funds, as they raise awareness, as they participate in helping families, supporting research. These are all the kinds of things. Um, I think it looks different for different people what, what they, can, they can do. But, but to me, from a community standpoint, it's, it's partnering with us whether it's physically coming up to Dorn Becker or, or to Randall Children's or joining with these foundations to help um, support these families. Thank you. Commissioner Maps. Um, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, I want to thank the good doctor for joining us today. And uh, Mr. Mayor, I want to thank you for setting a high bar which underscores how deeply the resolution before us today resonates with the people of Portland. And colleagues, I want to say this. I am proud to join you in proclaiming September 2023 to be Childhood Cancer Awareness Month here in Portland, Oregon. 
Over the past 50 years, researchers have made enormous advances treating kids with cancer, but as we heard today, there is still a lot of work left to do. Today, cancer re remains the leading cause of death by disease for American kids under the age of 15. This year in the United States, around 17,000 kids will be diagnosed with cancer. And the average age at diagnosis is six years old. Now, during National Cancer, Childhood Cancer Awareness Month, we honor those kids and we support the loved ones who care for them. During Childhood Cancer Awareness Month, we recognize the medical professionals and researchers who search for better treatments. During National Childhood Cancer Awareness Month, we remember the young lives cut short by cancer. And during National Childhood Cancer Awareness Month, we recommit ourselves to ending cancer as we know it. Now, colleagues, I believe that we can create a cancer-free future for our kids. That's why I will wrap up my comments today by encouraging anyone concerned about childhood cancers to visit www.cancer.gov. That site can connect you with trained specialists and resources on the symptoms, diagnosis, and treatment of childhood cancers. And with that, Mr. Merrill, I'll hand the floor back to you. Thank you, sir. Commissioner Ryan. Thank you, Mayor, for bringing this to the dais today and for your hard <coughs> comments earlier. Thank you, good doctor, for being here. It's a pleasure to meet you. Thank You're you. an outstanding leader, you can tell. I wanted to um, just acknowledge the hardworking people at Dornbecker and your colleagues at, um, at Randall's Children's Hospital. I think there's two Ronald McDonald houses in Portland. I'm sorry? Are there two Ronald McDonald houses in Portland? Are there two? I know. I should know two. that, shouldn't I? I, I <laughs> no, there's it's okay. one, yeah, there's for sure one over well. by Randall's, <laughs> and then there's the Rude Family Pavilion at, at yeah, OHSU. That's it. And I just wanted to acknowledge the employees that work with the families day in and day out. And I'll just tell a brief story. A dear friend from college, um, she works at Dornbecker. Her name is Susan Sherwood. She's a child life uh, specialist, went to Mills College to get those credentials back I know in the Susan 80s. Very well. You know her very well? Mm -hmm. Yeah, she's a, she's a dear friend. And uh, I always listen to her stories when we have mm -hmm. dinner, and it's so compelling. And then a story going back three decades now is um, another dear friend that goes back a decade for than Susan. Her son was there and did pass away. Mm -hmm. And they met one another and now are dear friends. And um, so I know that your employees go so far. So the story you told about receiving that note, I think that's what keeps your employees in this type of work. And I also know that to the parents out there, you never get over this. Grieving's hard no matter what, but this is one that you just never get over. So thank you for doing this type of work, for being a leader in this work, and for having all of us take a pause today thank you. Uh, to think about this uh, issue. I appreciate you. Thank you. Appreciate it as well. I'll just, uh, everybody said things already. I just want to thank you for being here and, and the proclamation and, and your testimony were very compelling for me today. And it, it just remind, reminds us of, you know, just the, um, the innocence of children, but also the hope that they bring during these, these hard times as well. And that's why um, they're special and vulnerable like flowers. And I just, um, I just want to thank you for bringing this you know, the urgency around this proclamation and reminding us um, uh, to take care um, of our most vulnerable uh, young members of our, of our community. So thank you. Thank you. I'll, I'll just uh, close out. First of all, I want to thank you know, all of the people in this community who work so hard on this. You mentioned Randall Children's Hospital, Dornbecker, Shriners, the Ronald McDonald Houses, uh, so many good things mm -hmm. happening. Mm -hmm. And uh, we should be really proud of that as a community. I, I also want to uh, return uh, a favor. Uh, I, I heard Phil Knight had said some things about me earlier this week, and I wanted to return um, the commentary by thanking him and Penny Knight for the Knight Cancer Research Institute right down here in the South Waterfront. Um, my view of Phil Knight is that he's a giant, and Penny too. And I suspect that 100 years from now, it may not be Nike 
that they're remembered for, even though I'm wearing their product <laughs> right now. <laughs> Me too. And, and we all love uh, Nike. But I think their lasting gift was the Knight Cancer Research Institute. I think it's a gift that will keep giving and giving and giving, not just to this community, but globally. And I think of the millions of lives that could potentially be saved and, and the role they are also playing around childhood cancer research. And I think of the parents. You know, I, I butchered the proclamation by blubbering my way through it, but my viewpoint is that if the kids and their parents can get through it, I can read a proclamation. <laughs> it's the least I could do. Um, but we, you know, as a community, care deeply about all of them. And I, I just think it's great that we have a community that has so many assets, so many people, so many researchers, so many medical professionals, and just a lot of volunteers in this community who care and are working so hard. And so it is important every year that we remember that. And yes, um, there's a large degree of loss and sadness, but there's also a lot of optimism Absolutely. and hope Absolutely. for what we can do going forward. So uh, thank you for being here today. Thank, thank, you. thank you for sharing your knowledge. Thank and you I know so you much. have a lot of work to do, so we'll let you get back to it. <laughs> thank you so much. Thank you. Appreciate your time. Yeah, appreciate thank you so much. Thank you. Next uh, item, please. Actually, why don't we take a, a break just because we, we want to give our, uh, our TV crew an opportunity to, to uh, take a break. Uh, when we come back, we'll do 767. We'll take a 10-minute recess. We are in recess.
Session. Thank you. Uh, first item, next item up is 767. Please, a report. Appoint Aga Zane to the Noise Review Board for term to end September 12th, 2026. Commissioner Rubio. Thank you. The Noise Review Board is an advisory body reviewing certain noise or variances for projects that range from nighttime construction projects to large outdoor concerts. And the board also works to develop long-term objectives for reducing sound levels in the community. The Noise Review Board members serve as a voice for the community and for industry, seeking to balance requests for noise variances with community livability concerns. The Review Board is comprised of five members, including three community member at large positions, a representative from the construction industry, and a professional in the field of acoustics. NRB members are appointed by council for a three-year term with the possibility of serving a second three-year term. I am pleased to present Aga Zain, Zain for a three-year appointment to serve as an, an NRB member filling the community member at large position. Beth Benton with BDS will now provide an introduction for the appointee. Good morning, Mayor, morning. Commissioners. I'm Beth Benton, Property Compliance Manager for the Bureau of Development Services, and I am pleased to present um, Aga Zane to the Noise Review Board appointee. Mr. Zane has over 10 years of experience analyzing both short and long-term business issues and building business relationships in a variety of areas such as general business operations, product development, and marketing here in the Portland area. He understands the value of developing good, positive relationships with others on his team as well as with customers and other professional work teams in order to achieve success. In addition, his varied experiences with nonprofits and working with a diverse group of individuals across Portland helps him better understand the experiences and the issues facing our communities. Um, this candidate will bring a wealth of expertise and experience to the Noise Review Board um, for the community at large seat. And lastly, um, with this appointment, all of the seats will be filled on the Noise Review Board. And at this time, I would like to turn it over to our chair, 
of the Norris Review Board, Mary Seip. Hi, everyone. Hi, Mary. Hi, it's nice to see you again. It's been a long thank time, you. Me Mayor. Too. <laughs> um, I just wanted to, first of all, um, thank Mr. Zane for stepping forward and uh, volunteering for the board. Um, it's, it's funny because my very first visit to the city council was in May of 2014, and I came with a group of neighbors about a noise issue that we were having. And here I am nine years later, and I'm chair of the Noise Review Board. Um, <laughs> and it just speaks to if you speak out and you step up, you can facilitate change in our community. And um, it is, it's people like Mr. Zane uh, and the staff, such as Beth and the rest of the staff um, at the noise control office, uh, that really help keep our community livable. And um, I just, I just want to say thank you and um, how exciting it is. We've been shorthanded on the, on the board for a good 11 of the last 12 months, and so it's great to have a full board, and we will start moving forward with a lot of our initiatives, and thank you. Thanks, Mary. <clears throat> Colleagues, any questions? <laughs> Commissioner Maps? I was just gonna move that we accept the report. Uh, and uh, Commissioner Maps moves, can we get a second? Second. Second, do we have any public testimony? No one signed up. All right, very good, please call the roll. Gonzalez. Aye. Maps. I just want to thank Mr. Zane for agreeing to serve on this important board. I vote aye. Rubio. Um, I also want to thank Mr. Zane for his service on the Noise Review Board, as well as um, Mary as chair, for serving chair and for getting involved in our city. Appreciate your time. Um, and also Beth for bringing this forward and all the good work that you do every day. You don't get to come up before council every day, but I just want to take an, an opportunity to thank you for, for your dedication to your job. So thank you, Beth. Um, I vote aye. Ryan. Yes, uh, thank you, Beth. I worked with you in the era of being on Zooms all the time, so it's always great to see you in person. Um, Mary, I really loved your story about yep. service and how it all organically happens. That was a great story, and sounds like you found a wonderful new commissioner in Mr. Zane. I vote aye. Wheeler. Uh, I want to second that. Uh, Beth, thanks for your leadership, and um, you know, Mary, uh, yeah, I don't know how you do it year after year after year after year, but you step up in a big way. You are a model citizen in every sense. And thank you for the time and the energy and the dedication you put into our community. Um, there, there is uh, an issue that, that I do want to just raise substantively, and, and that is that we are seeing, I believe, and, and there's a chance I'm wrong, but I think I'm not, that we're seeing an increase in noise-related concerns in our community. And as we approach the budget process, which really kicks off in earnest late October, early November, I'm gonna lean on you a little bit for some input and advice on how we might best staff our, our noise office. I, th right. I think, don't we only have like one noise officer right now? We do. For, for a very large city, and yes. that's, that's probably asking too much. So let's, let's put our heads together and uh, see what we can do there and, and maybe build to a three or a four year plan in Sounds terms of, great. of what you think it should look like. Um, Mr. Zane, thank you uh, for volunteering for this important committee. I'm happy to vote on the report is accepted. The appointments are approved. Thank you. Thank you. Next item, seven, uh, uh, sevens, where, Yes, 776, please. And that is a uh, non-emergency ordinance. Initiate foreclosure, foreclosure action on nine properties for the collection of delinquent city liens placed against the properties. Colleagues, this ordinance is part of a coordinated effort by the Mayor's Office, the Bureau of Development Services, the Office of Management and Finance Revenue Division, as well as the City Attorney's Office to pursue remedies for vacant and distressed properties with delinquent lien payments. It begins the foreclosure proceedings on seven properties with delinquent city liens that are eligible for foreclosure in accordance with city code 5.30. The liens were placed against the properties by the Bureau of Development Services for code enforcement violations, various nuisances, nuisance abatement, and or chronic offender violations. 
These properties have been identified as causing significant problems for neighbors. They are the subject of multiple and frequent police calls and numerous enforcement activities. The Revenue Division works closely with BDS to identify properties with delinquent account balances, many of which are designated as vacant and distressed properties by BDS's Extremely Distressed Properties Enforcement Program. Kevin Foster, Foreclosure Prevention Manager, and Sharon Nickelberry Rogers, Budget and Lean Supervisor, are with us today to take us through this item. Welcome. Good morning, Mayor, and good morning, Commissioners. For the record, I'll state my name, Kevin Foster. I'm the Foreclosure Prevention Manager in the Bureau of Revenue and Financial Services Revenue Division. With me today is Sharon Nickelberry Rogers, Supervisor of the Budget and Liens Team with the Revenue Division. Also here is Mike Leefield, Property, Compli Property Compliance Division Supervisor with the Bureau of Development Services. Joining us virtually is Bridget O'Callaghan, the City Treasurer, and Dan Simon, the Deputy City Attorney. And, and I'm sorry to interrupt, but while you're switching slides, as, as you know, I'm going to make three amendments. Are, are you gonna discuss those before or after? Uh, during the present. Very good, thank you. Next slide, please. I'm going to start by giving a high level overview of the City of Portland assessments, liens, collections, and foreclosure program. Assessments include code violations, nuisance complaints, also various activities for new developments and infrastructure improvements. Each assessment results in a lien being placed on the property. There are two types of liens, non-bonded and bonded. After the lien is placed on the property and becomes 30 days delinquent, collection efforts begin. The collection team makes calls and sends letters to get the owner to set up a payment arrangement for their delinquent lien. After 90 days and there's been no response, it is forwarded over to me for review. After my review is completed, foreclosure is used as a last resort to engage the owner for eligible liens that are 60 days delinquent for non-bonded and one year delinquent for bonded. The majority of the liens on the seven properties we are presenting for foreclosure are non-bonded liens for code violations and nuisance complaints. Next slide, please. This is a combined effort by the Bureau of Development Services who recommends priority properties and some of them are from the Extremely Distressed Properties Enforcement Program the city's attorney's office identifies barriers that decide if the property is a good candidate for foreclosure or not. Such barriers can include pending litigation on the property or the property being, or the owner being delinquent on the property taxes. As part of my role in the revenue division, I review delinquent accounts and Bureau of Development Services foreclosure reports to determine which accounts meet the criteria for recommendation to foreclosure. Lastly, the city treasurer conducts the foreclosure sale. Next slide, please. The city of Portland and the community at large have the reasonable expectation that property owners are responsible for the maintenance of their properties. The city, through its property compliance division in the Bureau of Development Services, has adopted a property maintenance minimum standard. After a complaint is received, when a property doesn't meet the minimum standard, the Bureau of Development Services approach includes appeals, a host of waivers that property owners may qualify for to avoid liens, and the opportunity to connect property owners with available repair assistance programs for their situation. The Bureau of Development Services monthly code enforcement fees are referred to the Revenue, Di Revenue Division for assessment after the opportunities or incentives to correct the violation have been exhausted. Next slide, please. This targeted approach began with the mayor's office in 2016. The target is vacant and distressed properties throughout the city. The goal is to minimize the effects and problems these properties create in the community. Foreclosure being used as a last resort. The ultimate goal of the foreclosure is to motivate the owner to bring the property into a productive use. All of the properties we're proposing today meet the criteria. Next slide, please. Here is a list of characteristics of vacant and distressed properties. 
The common theme is little to no action is taken by the property owners to rehabilitate their properties. These properties cause public health and safety concerns in the community. If not corrected, the city fees increase over time. Next slide, please. The city offers many opportunities to property owners to correct the violations and solve the delinquencies on their properties. As an example, when property owners are willing to resolve the violations, they can contact the Bureau of Development Services and request a review of their case after the issue is corrected and the case is closed. Once that review is complete, the amount owed is typically decreased. Then the revenue division will provide a payment plan that allows the property owner to repay the amount owed in monthly installments, which can go up to 60 months. Another example is the Bureau of Development Services Amnesty Program, which is a one-time program offering automatic reductions once the case is closed. The owner, the owner can also work with the Bureau of Development Services to obtain a waiver. The owner has the opportunity to get on a payment plan arrangement with the revenue division. After a pause in foreclosures during the pandemic and, and position vacancy, and also the rebranding of this position, we have recently resumed outreach to property owners about delinquent accounts that, about delinquent accounts that will be considered for foreclosure. As of today, we have been unsuccessful in getting the owners to make a payment arrangement. Next slide, please. In the past, foreclosure has motivated owners to address the delinquent liens on their property. Just as an example, yesterday, one of the properties scheduled to be part of this foreclosure list came in right before close and paid off their delinquent liens. Also, another property, again, scheduled to be part of this list, we've made arrangements with, as of this morning, to remove from the foreclosure list. Since June 2016, 25 properties have been on ordinances for council consideration. Over 1.5 million has been recovered. Our last sale was held in October 2022. Next slide, please. So the figures on this, due to the uh, two properties that we're removing, uh, the figures have been uh, decreased. We will send an updated slide, you guys, so you have it for the record. Today, we are recommending seven properties for foreclosure, 40 liens in total, and roughly $729,000 owed. Five of these properties are in the Extremely Distressed Properties Enforcement Program. Two of these properties have chronic offender liens on them. The Extremely Distressed Programs Enforcement Program was approved by Council in the fall of 2011. This program is managed by the Bureau of Development Services. The purpose of this program is to enforce property maintenance regulations. Often these properties are referred to this program by the Police Bureau and District Housing Inspectors. The ultimate goal is to minimize the impacts to the surrounding neighborhood from the property being vacant and distressed. Therefore, the Revenue Division recommends that Council approve these properties for foreclosure. One property is still outstanding from a 2020 ordinance to be included in this upcoming sale. Next slide, please. In order to stay true to our city values, we wanted to look at equity in this process and ensure that black, indigenous, and people of color are not being disproportionately harmed. We looked at the data of the people who actually lived in the property as they would be most impacted by foreclosure. We used census data from 2020 provided by the Population Research Center which confirmed at that time 87% of the properties were vacant and that BIPOC community, community members would not be impacted if we proceeded with foreclosure. In August of 2023, the Bureau of Development Services sent out an inspector to each of the properties and confirmed that all the properties are vacant. Next slide, please. The first property is located at 1225 Northeast 109th Avenue. There are three liens against this property. The oldest one dates back to 2018, and there's roughly $33,000 owing. The property taxes are delinquent for 2022. The property has been the subject of complaints for disabled vehicles and nuisance complaints. 
This property has been vacant since 2015. There has been police involvement at the property. In the last 60 days, we've sent out two certified letters to the owner. The owner is represented by counsel, and I've spoken with the attorney as recently as yesterday who informed me they are working to clean up the property and they plan to sell the property. Next slide, please. The next property is located at 9124 Northeast Prescott Street. There are five liens against this property. The oldest is from 2015 and roughly $119,000 is owed. This property is an extremely distressed properties enforcement program case. The property is a subject of periodic complaints for squatters and campers on the property. The property is deteriorating with portions of the building open, exposing it to weather. There has been police activity at the residence and in the nearby vicinity. The property taxes are three years past due. In the last 60 days, we've sent out two certified letters to the owner and we've been unable to reach the owner by phone. Next slide, please. This is the property that we're actually, this is one of the properties we're removing from the list. Um, next slide, please. Can you just clarify why we're pulling uh, some of these properties? Yes. So this property, we've met with the owner this morning, and we're working on an arrangement to resolve the delinquent liens. Okay. And these were these were property taxes as well here. This one. Let's see. No, on this one, the the property on Beach, they're not delinquent in their property taxes. High level, what was the amount, uh, where were the drivers of the 391,000? Uh, there was a, um, let's, Let me check yes, please. This one is 6224. So uh, court uh, code enforcement and nuisance liens. Mm. Any idea of the flavor of the code enforcement and nuisance claims? No, I don't have that additional detail. Okay. I know some of it was for permit for work being done without a permit and uh, disabled vehicles on the property. And that's, that's what I have. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, no problem. All right. Next slide, please. The next property is located at 111 Northeast Killingsworth Street. There are two liens against this property. The oldest one dates back to April 2023. Roughly $9,000 is owed. The property taxes are one year delinquent. The property has generated many complaints to the Bureau of Development Services. The complaints indicate there is frequent squatter activity at the property. There have been two fires at the property. One was caused by arson. There's also been police activity at the residence. One of the neighbors was recently interviewed by Coin6 News about this property. In the last 60 days, we've sent out two letters, two certified letters to the owner, and have, we've been unable to reach the owner by phone. Next slide, please. The next property is located at 6417 Southeast 84th Avenue. There are four lanes against this property. The oldest one dates back to 2012. Roughly owed as $170,000. $170, the property was vacated under a code hearing order. There are two accessory structures on the lot. The, ex the accessory structures have been combined, which create an unpermitted dwelling. There has been police involvement at the property. The property taxes are owing for 2022. This is an extremely distressed property enforcement program case. In the last 60 days, we've sent out two certified letters to the owner. I have spoken with the owner who was, who was to contact the Bureau of Development Services to work on correcting the violations. I did communicate with the owner yesterday over email and she confirmed that she had, she had not reached out to the Bureau of Development Services. She let me know her plan is to try and sell the property prior to the foreclosure sale date. Next slide, please. May, may I ask a question? And, sure. And this, this will obviously come up. So they call you at the 11th and three quarters hour, and they say, oh, we're all over it now, when they've basically been unreachable, unmoved, unwilling mm -hmm. to do anything. So 
Uh, and, and I realize that this process is designed to make it difficult for government to take people's private homes. And so I, I want to just acknowledge that I understand that. But at what point do you say enough is enough? So they've reached out to you. Now do they ha are, are they on the clock? Is there a timeline? Is there some commitment they have to make by a certain date? Otherwise, these go back onto the list? The answer to that would be yes. Um, they will be closely monitored uh, and put on notice with what type of things they are supposed to do by a certain <coughs> deadline. And so some of our, the, one of the properties we're removing may show up again because um, they didn't meet whatever commitments they were supposed to. Right, and, and, and I'll just say, um, and I'll, of course, be introducing some amendments in a moment, um, but these property owners have not de demonstrated an interest up to this point in doing anything to remediate these properties. And so I don't have a lot of confidence that when they give you their word that they're gonna change and things are gonna be different going forward, they haven't earned that trust from my perspective or from the perspective of their neighbors. So I, I do hope we are diligent in ensuring that if, if they wanna stop this process and do the right thing, that they actually do it. And if they don't, I wanna see this come back before council and continue the foreclosure process. Thank you for your support. That's yeah, and, I, the and I appreciate the good work you're doing. Thank you. The next property is located at 6402 Southeast 103rd Avenue. There are seven liens against this property. The oldest one dates back to 2022. Roughly $159,000 $159, is owed. This property is uninhabitable and poses an environmental risk due to the non-compliant septic system. The septic <laughs> system currently drains into the Johnson Creek. This is an extremely distressed property enforcement program case. There has been police activity at the property. In the last 60 days, we've sent out two certified letters to the owner. I have not been able to reach the owner by phone. However, the Bureau of Environmental Services has been in contact with the owner as the Bureau plans to, as the Bureau is interested in purchasing the property. Next slide, please. The next property is located at 2826 Southeast 87th Avenue. There are nine liens against this property. The oldest one dates back to 1998. Roughly $151,000 is owed. This is an extremely distressed property enforcement program case. The property has had two significant fires. The second fire destroyed the structure. Prior to the fire, the property was the subject to frequent complaints for trespass and vandalism. In the last 60 days, we've sent out two certified letters to the owner and no contact has been made by phone. Next slide, please. The next property is located at 1229 North Bryant Street. There are 10 liens against this property. The oldest one dates back to 2019 and roughly $88,000 is owed. The accessory structure on the property burned in 2019, resulting in damage to a neighboring structure. In 2020, a police officer was injured while assisting with the vacate at the property. The property is subject to squatters and several break-ins. The property is adjacent to an alley, which allows for unobserved access. There have been continuous complaints for yard maintenance and trash cleanup. This is an extremely distressed property enforcement program case. In the last 60 days, we've sent out two certified letters to the owner. I've spoken with the owner who lives out of state. He told me he would be working to get this property demolished and also working, on get, working with the Bureau of Development Services to resolve the violations. As of today, there's been no movement on the owner's part. These are the seven properties we are presenting for foreclosure today. Next slide, please. Why were there, could you go back to the two before? Sure. Because I think that's the one that said since 1998. Yeah. 
jaw drop. Um, how? Like, how has one been on there since 1998? So this borrower, or this, sorry, this owner, the 1998, I believe, was a system development charge. So that's either a, a infrastructure improvement. Let me just confirm that. Yes, it was a system development charge. And they, at, they were actually on a payment plan and did make payments up until 1998 when they defaulted. OK, but since 1998, there's been frequent concerns? Well, the next lien didn't come on until 2010. And at that time, it looks like left flowing on that original lien from 98 was $3,000. OK, thanks. I just had to pause there for a minute because that one stuck <laughs> out quite a bit. I understand. All right. And then next slide, please. Next slide. So this property, this is the one where the owner came in yesterday and paid off the liens that we're owing. Next slide. This property is located at- Let me ask you a question on that. So they've paid sure. off the liens. Yes. But to the degree that a property still is not compliant with code or poses a hazard, how, how is that then remediated as part of this process? Well, what we'll be doing is giving the owner's information to BDS and BDS will work with them to make sure everything is corrected. However, this is a particular owner who indicated that she has a person lined up to sell the property to. So oh, okay. she'll be able to pass that information on. Great, thank you. This property is located at 5080 Southeast Cooper Street. This property was approved by ordinance for foreclosure in 2020. The amount owed at the time was, 92, was roughly $92,000. The property did not sell at the last foreclosure sale. The amount owed has increased to now roughly $108,000. Two certified letters have been mailed to the, borrower, to the owner within the last 60 days, and we've been unable to reach the owner by phone. Next slide, please. Can I ask you a question? When you, when you say sold, um, are they sold with a reserve price, or is it just the lowest bidder? You're talking about for the foreclosure sale? Yeah, when you, sale? You, you said it didn't sell at the last foreclosure sale. Is, is there a minimum reserve? The, the minimum is the amount of the outstanding liens. Ah, okay. That's uh, the amount that it'll be auctioned off for. And, you know, it could be a bidding word, but unfortunately for this one, it was not. Got it. Thank. That's <laughs> helpful. Oh, yeah, sure. Yes. Uh, uh, hi, Mike Liefeld, Bureau of Development Services. Right. Actually, the sale price is the greater of the liens owing or 75% of the assessed value from the county. The greater So of. there is a minimum okay. sale price because this is a sale that is on behalf of the owner, proceeds after the liens are paid off, goes back to the property owner. Okay, and, and so, so if, if they owe $100,000 and it sells for 200, then the property owner will still get the additional 100, is that correct? Correct. Okay, thank you, that's helpful. Thank you. The next step in the city's foreclosure process you will vote on whether to move forward with the ordinance. If approved, the ordinance authorizes the city treasurer to conduct the foreclosure sale. The property owner may pay the amount owed up to the sale date. After the sale is administered, the property owner has, one year, has a one-year redemption period. This concludes my presentation. I'd be happy to answer any questions you may have. Great. Colleagues, anything else? Uh, I'd like to, uh, based on the information shared by our presenters today, I have three amendments to make to this ordinance. One property owner, as you heard, originally listed within this item satisfied their outstanding liens late yesterday. Therefore, my first amendment seeks to remove them from the list of properties. First, I motion to amend the ordinance to reflect the removal of property number nine, which is 14214 Southeast Crystal Spring Street from the list of properties in the ordinance to update Exhibit A to reflect this change and to remove Exhibit B-9. Can I get a second? Second. A second property owner is connected, Commissioner Maps seconds. A second, thank you. 
The second property owner is connected with staff handling these matters, seeking to address their outstanding liens in an effort to encourage engagement and collaboration from our neighbors. My second amendment seeks to remove them from the list of properties. Therefore, I motion to amend the ordinance to reflect the removal of property 3624-638 North Beach from the list of properties in the ordinance to update Exhibit A and to reflect this change and to remove Exhibit B3. Can I get a second? Second. Commissioner Mapp seconds, thank you. And thirdly, I motion to amend the title of the ordinance to reflect the changes within the previous two motions. The amended title will read, quote, initiate foreclosure auction on certain properties for the collection of delinquent city liens placed against the properties. Can I get a second? Second. Commissioner Mapps seconds again. Uh, we'll now hear public testimony on these items, if there is any. We have two people signed up. First up is Mike Lindbergh. Thank you. Welcome back, Commissioner. Thank you very much. It's been a while. I was glad to see uh, Robert Butler testify yeah. before the hearing today. I recall that 43 years ago, Today, he was in the council chambers, as it was then, to start his citizen testimony at the 9.30 time slot. Wow. Mm. Mr. Mayor, members of the city council, my name is Mike Lindbergh, and I was asked to help several property owners in northeast Portland, with a, help them with a significant problem that they had in terms of an adjacent property that had a, provided a substantial nuisance. Since an absentee owner bought the property at 111 Northeast Killingsworth in March of 2022, the neglect has presented one problem after another, more and more severe as time has gone on. You heard reference sometime to Nightmare on Elm Street well, the neighbors feel this has been a nightmare on Killingsworth Street. You have a report before you from the Bureau of Development Services which describes very specifically the nature of the problem. 20 911 calls to police and fire. Crimes, squatters, garbage, no matter, even if there's been notification to board up the property, it was not boarded up meaning the property frequently has just been completely open. Um, and in fact, I drove by it a couple times myself and took a number of photos. Uh, and uh, it was just kind of unbelievably bad in terms of the state of the property. I particularly take note in terms of not only the police calls, but the impact that this has had on the fire barrel. There, was, there were several fires and this sort of culminated in one fire in June that was so bad that there were many firefighters, several engines, and this prompted Coin TV to do a special report on this particular property and as it represents a larger problem throughout the city. The, at, during that last fire where the flames, and I have a video of it for anybody that would like to look at it in more detail, Flames going extremely high in the neighborhood, neighbors hosing down their home to prevent the spread of fire. I'm here today to simply testify to have you support the foreclosure that's on the city council agenda. And I want to thank in particular the mayor's office for working on ways over the last few years to expedite this foreclosure process. This was really encouraging to see the report earlier today. And I want to thank Commissioner Rubio's office for being so responsive and helpful. Your staff person, Megan Beyer, in terms of navigating bureaucracy. Thank Commissioner Gonzalez's office by making Tom Miller available to, so that they could really get a look at the impact on the fire bureau. Um, and the Bureau of Development Services itself, which has been extremely helpful. So with that, I'd like to thank you for your time. Thank you, sir. Appreciate yes. your being here. Next up, we have Randall Baker. Welcome, Mr. Baker. Mayor Thanks Mayor for being here. Commissioners. I'm Randall Baker. I'm an attorney here in Portland, and I represent Lori Smith. She's one of the uh, property owners listed in the agenda before you, and it's property 1225 Northeast 
109th Avenue. And I'm speaking here today uh, in supplement of the written materials that I just submitted yesterday. In submitting those materials, um, we indicated that we support the agenda before you with changes. And I did so because I can tell you personally and professionally here, we certainly agree uh, with the land that uh, landowners who willingly and intentionally allow nuisance conditions on their properties to exist should be held accountable and, and by whatever means necessary to bring them into compliance for the sake of their neighbors and their neighborhoods. I personally have lived on a block with a home like this and whether there's trouble going on at it or not, you still have the knot in your stomach thinking there's going to be. And there's been plenty of trouble at this property over the years. Um, but it's not a situation where there's been an unwilling um, owner of this property. It's just not the situation. Ms. Smith is 80 years old. She has significant cognitive impairments. She has severe short-term memory loss and to a point where she effectively has no executive function. Uh, she cannot manage her affairs. She's got dementia, and it's become increasingly worse over some time. She suffers anxieties that essentially paralyze her from making any type of decision other than basic needs. And certainly she doesn't have the, the ability to manage her affairs like you or I would, or a property like this. I know this because I've been dealing with her for six straight weeks. She's gone missing several times during that period, including for three days, where I had to call the Gresham police to put in a missing persons call for her. But eventually was found at a Denny's, which was a safe place for her when her family lived. They always used to go there. The employees know her, and they contacted people, and she'd been there all day. Um, for the past several years, she's been living in a room in an extended, um, extended stay motel. She has no living family members. Her parents are gone, her husband's gone, her only sibling, her brother, who she lived with the last year of his life through cancer, he's gone. No children, no nephews, no nieces. I'm here because she doesn't, in short, she's not a, a landowner who needs motivation. I have been involved since early August. We have a power of attorney appointed for her. The property, there are no nuisance, current nuisances on this property. They've been cleaned up. We have three neighbors who are interested in purchasing it. I'm on steady terms with them. I've been to the property six times myself. As I speak today, there's someone cleaning out the interior. I've tried to contact BDS last month to address and resolve these liens, and that's my intent. I didn't get a return call. I did speak with Mr. Foster yesterday. I also spoke with staff, including Mr. Foster in August, actually asked to be contacted if there's any further action. So I was surprised to learn from the news yesterday that this property is on the list. We have been in swift action for the last five weeks. We don't need any motivation. The liens on this property are 32,000. We're gonna resolve those. I wanna resolve them this week. And we hope to sell this property still this month to one of the neighbors. They have put up with this property for far too long. They're the ones who, who should reap the rewards of this property being cleaned up. And I can tell you, if Ms. Smith truly understood the condition of the property and the stress she's put on her neighbors, she'd be ashamed. She truly would. She's not a bad person. She just simply has not had the ability. These notices from the city, I was delivered banker boxes of mail. Notices from the city, notices from utilities, notices from other entities, unopened. These have gone out, they've been collected from her P.O. box or in her motel room. They're simply not opened. So I ask you to approve this agenda, but make an exception for this property, even if we could have 30 days to address the issues. That's all I need, because we've come, the neighbors will attest how far we've come in the last five weeks. I'll take any questions. Commissioner Maps. Uh, Mr. Mayor, I'll just kind of turn this one back to you or staff. Or could we have, maybe we could have staff come up? Or I'll just, um, let me make a statement, uh, which is I, I appreciate you uh, being here today and I hope um, that staff can work with you to resolve this situation. I mean, off script, I, 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 re I, I represent to the council, I will make this happen. In case you can't tell, I'm, I'm invested with this yeah, client. Yeah. She's she's a really sweet person. She really has been drifting out there alone, though. Yeah. It, it's true. 
Uh, thank you. I'll lower my hand now and thank see you. how the discussion evolves. Thank you, Commissioner. Commissioner Gonzalez. Just two quick follow-up questions. So you have been retained by Mrs. Smith to represent her in this matter, or? The reason I'm involved is an acquaintance from out of state just happened to come into town in July met with her, realized what, how severe her condition was, found some sort of letterhead from a matter that I represented her several years ago, very limited representation. Frankly, I recognize she had some trouble then. It's far worse the last three years. He contacted me and brought her into the office. Um, her, her memory span is about 10 minutes. She, she's missed appointments with me. I can call her today and she's not gonna really understand a lot of what's going on. But I guarantee you, if she saw the property and understood what she'd done to her neighbors, she would be the first. She's broken down to me. She's really, frankly, ashamed of her cognitive. She recognizes she has impairments, not to the extent they are. But um, that's how I got involved. And this, this person, who since now is her power of attorney, and since he came on board, since we put together a team to try to address these issues, we're, we're moving really swiftly. I know the enforcement officer, Mark Davis, the nuisance officer, if he went out there today, he wouldn't recognize the property. Um, again, the neighbors can attest to it. And we're really hopeful that one, we've got three of them who are interested, that we're going to sell to them. Well, and I just, the, the reason for my question, just to be crystal clear, is, you know, if you've been engaged and you're representing her, you know, the, the minimum you being notified, uh, is a reasonable expectation if it's if there's some ambiguity as to whether there's an engagement and you're in fact representing her then that's you know absolutely it, it, representing a little, her a little different dynamic but um, I am surprised that that as of the third week of August I made it very clear that if there's any problems with the property if there's any indication that anybody's moving forward with enforcement please contact me because and, and Mr. Foster referenced some notices that were sent out fairly recently those might be sent to the air. She, she just didn't get them. And if anybody had called me, I would have been on it. Um, and I really have reached out to BDS. I didn't have the right number. The first number that I was given by city staff, I just found out yesterday, they asked me, why are you calling this number? I finally reached a human. Nobody had returned my calls. And I got a hold of property compliance and left actually a message for Mr. Liefeld. Um, and in fairness to him, it was late yesterday afternoon. I didn't realize it was gonna be here. I read a news article uh, on my phone yesterday and realized this property's on this agenda today, and I had no idea uh, that it was going to be. So I'm just asking for 30 days if we can table, bring it back on. Mayor, I agree with you. It's not an 11th hour rush, um, you know. The owner's been caught, uh-oh, better do something. We've been doing something since the beginning of August, since people who can process information have been involved. Mayor, I'd be interested to hear from staff. Just, I, I have appreciation when a council requests to be notified before action being taken, and if for whatever reason we didn't jump through those hoops, that's relevant to my perspective on it. Uh, but I just would like to understand what our process here is here. And could I also just add, we can resolve this even if you place it in foreclosure status. I understand that. But invariably, there's probably going to be additional expenses she can't afford that with what we've already expended to bring the yard, the interior. We're talking like $10,000 to clean up the interior of this property. And um, frankly, there's a stigma to it too, which I'll have to tell her that it's in foreclosure. And if we can avoid that, because you need somebody motivated, I'm motivated. We're gonna get this done. I, I wish you owned the property. Um, you had uh, a question for staff? Mike Liefeld, Bureau of Development Services. I, I think we certainly appreciate Mr. Baker's uh, attention to this issue now. Uh, the city's process to bring this to city council for a foreclosure vote upon second reading simply just keeps that process moving. So if council does vote to foreclose on it, the next step is preparing a sale, which is gonna happen 60 to 90 days later. So there, there's quite a bit of process a timeline that's afforded to an owner to still pay off the liens and remove it from the list. After a sale occurs, if there is a bidder, there's a 12 month redemption period where an owner uh, asserts their rights, they can still pay off the liens and retain the property. So the city's position at this point is to, I, 
I think our recommendation would be to move forward with the process. Uh, there's still time afforded for uh, Mr. Baker to continue working with the property owner to achieve the desired result of, of selling it through a private sale rather than a city foreclosure sale. And I think there is a lot of benefit to that, um, but there is time afforded to allow that process to occur. Thank you. Dakota, did you want to add something? I did. Thank you, Mayor. Dakota Thompson, Deputy Director of Community Safety in the Mayor's Office. Um, one of the other properties on this list that we just heard an amendment about, part of the rationale behind that was a power of attorney situation that um, injected uh, new relationships and our ability to remedy the problems. It seems like we're stepping into a place where that is happening, and I'm heartened to hear that. As has been said many times, the entire point of this is to have a better relationship with these property owners so that we can help the community surrounding them. Um, so I think we're, we're fast approaching that situation, and I want to echo what Mr. Layfeld just mentioned, that we have some wiggle room here um, with respect to ensuring everybody is getting what they need, including uh, the represented party here. And I know that um, council has spoken eloquently about wanting to achieve that end as well. Yeah, and, and I appreciate you being here, Mr. Baker and Dakota. Okay. I appreciate your advice to me that we continue with the process as designated. Uh, Commissioner Ryan, I think you were next. Oh, I can lower my hand because I wanted the staff to come up to give further explanations. Gotcha. Thank you. Great. Uh, Commissioner Maps. Yeah, I just wanted to uh, invite Mr. Baker to respond to the staff comments that we just heard. Well, again, just on principle, the problem I'm having is Ms. Smith, Lori's being lumped in with these willing and intentional, these defiant landowners. That it simply isn't what the case has been. And I was told that over the phone that, well, we've had all these notices, it's gone on for so long, and I felt like I was talking to the wall because you can send 20 more notices. If I hadn't met her, it'd be foreclosed. And keep sending notices. I don't know what would have happened if this acquaintance hadn't contacted me because they weren't going anywhere other than a, a PO box. I have them in chronological order. They're all unopened. So that's my problem with, again, saying, well, we'll move the process forward. You can redeem it or you can end it during foreclosure. I don't think this property, it's not like the others. It shouldn't be in foreclosure. And that's my problem with it. And I, again, I'm trying to spare her for whatever that's worth. Financially speaking, I don't want to address all the other fronts I'm trying to save her sinking ships on. But I'm trying to save her the stigma of knowing her property's gone into foreclosure when it's not needed. That isn't what motivated us. I, I was motivated when they brought her into me. I was motivated when I drove out to the property two days later and met with the first neighbor who, you know the expression, don't shoot the messenger? Mm. Yeah, we had to work through that because uh, from the moment I got involved, uh, I, I saw what was going on here. And so I, I'm just asking for 30 days to get it resolved. I'm not asking for six months or a year. Nobody's going to return with this property. We're getting it done. Um, thank you very much for um, this dialogue. I have no more questions. Commissioner Gonzalez. Uh, just one follow-up question to staff. Uh, when we're talking about redemption scenarios, you know, I, I've, I've been involved in pro bono foreclosure actions in the past representing seniors in, in, a, in very similar situations. Uh, we were able to amicably resolve it prior to foreclosure, but the, I guess my question is, I have not really been through a redemption process and really thought through, you know, it's one thing, often in this case, you're dealing with a senior who's going to, frankly, just wants to liquidate the property, pay off the liabilities and move on. And that's often optimal for everybody, um, which it sounds like this is this scenario. But I'm just trying to play through if this did proceed to foreclosure and then where she has the right to redeem within a year. I'm just, is there any kind of market for her interest there? Um, and, and I'm just sort of thinking out loud, does she have the ability to liquidate the property at that point? I mean, it's foreclosed on. Um, I'm just sort of curious what you've seen. And then the second question is, is there other liens on the property that we're aware of outside of the city of Portland? To answer the second question first, I'm not aware of any other liens outside the city of Portland. We do a title search at all when we... We do 
do a title search and due diligence. City Attorney's Office also helps us with that. So I, I don't have that information. Perhaps um, Mr. Foster has it. I don't know if that's in the file. Um, the first question about the redemption period, I don't recall from any city foreclosure sale that a property owner has redeemed during that afforded 12 month period. Um, essentially new bidders who come to city hall and purchase a property at the city foreclosure sale are given a bill of sale. And it admittedly causes some bit of problems for the next 12 months. Yeah. Uh, do they exercise their rights? Um, you know, are they gonna put money into the property when there's still this redemption period? And I think um, other like, uh, like other judicial foreclosures, there is some opportunity to negotiate that interest and um, um, sell that interest to make sure the redemption period goes away because the, the, the owner can um, cede the redemption rights to the mm -hmm. purchaser to move things along. So I think that would be uh, afforded or an opportunity, um, but essentially that's what it is. If, if the owner comes in during the 12 month period and pays off the lien amounts and the foreclosure costs, then the sale is terminated. Got it. Um, okay, I mean, I, I'm putting my cards on the table here. I, we have to be rigorous about derelict properties in the city of Portland right now. It is exposing us to an incredible amount of risk across the board, including fires. Um, Having said that, I have been through this with seniors in the foreclosure scenario. Um, when you have someone represented by counsel, um, I think trying to find a third party sell is gonna maximize the pie for everyone involved uh, outside of foreclosure if we can, if we can do it. Um, so I would be open to removing this one at this time if we have some assurances we can keep it on a tight, tight leash. If you have them from me, I should add, she's not living on her own any longer. She's living with a family, and they're looking for an assisted living memory care facility for her. But um, if there's a way to even 30-day delay, and I don't know the agenda procedure here, but spring it in 30 days. If I haven't kept my word here and we haven't resolved what we need to, then add it to the list then. And, and I would just include in the, any request if there's colleagues support here, and that's the big if, but, but it is that there's some assurances on how we're gonna maintain the property, that there's regular visits and supervision, because that's our challenge with derelict properties, obviously, it's-, it's uh, uh, We have a set of neighbors here, they're, they're in charge. There were homeless people living in this property, and they weren't, uh, the neighbors weren't able to get responses from the police, it was during the worst of the worst, and they, they had some, discussions with the homeless in there. I'll tell you, it got so bad, the city, somebody plywooded up all the windows, all the boards, impact screws. They went up on the ceiling, or the roof of the house, and cut in with a sledgehammer an opening and rappelled down, mission impossible. And I, I've been on the roof, I sealed it up myself because the rains were, anyway, um, it, it, it's a stunning situation, but we're trying to resolve it. These neighbors have eyes on it. I'm driving by the property every other day, Commissioner. Um, it, it happens to be coincidentally near a, uh, a home where my mother's living, who also has dementia. So it's literally within four blocks of where she is. So I just swing by the property. I check in with the neighbors. They're checking in all the time. We now have a crew going through the interior. It's gonna take them 10 days, three 30-foot dumpsters probably, I've been quoted. They're on site, so we've got activity. We left a barrier of limbs on the two side fences to keep the homeless out. I'll tell you, I was out there three nights ago. Somebody rode by on a bike, and you know that look. It wasn't, he wasn't headed to a book club, and I could tell that he, he recognized this property. But he saw me, our eyes met, and he drove on. But you're right, there's gotta be vigilance on it. I, mean, I, I thought of the idea of security there, but I think the neighbors, between all of us, we're all working for the same thing. I, my last question is to staff. I mean, is there a way to, if, if we amend, remove it at this time, how much does that delay your process? I mean, what, can you, do we have to start everything over again or what, what mechanically would happen? If, can, we, can we give a 30-day pause here uh, mechanically? Again, should there be support for it? I 
don't believe I'm the most appropriate staff to answer questions right. about council procedures. I believe today we would, you'd be authorizing removing it from the list so the other properties could move forward to a second reading so the foreclosure vote could occur and then the city treasurer could begin work on preparing those for sale. Um, again, to go back to an earlier point, um, keeping it on the list today and even going to next week for a vote, even with a vote, the, the, the opportunity to do a third party sale is, is afforded. That, that work can continue and the, the city treasurer has timelines they have to meet with notice to prepare a sale. It's, I think it's 60 to 90 days before we could even schedule a sale. So there is time afforded for um, everything to happen in terms of liquidating, selling the property, maximizing the return um, if foreclosure today and with a vote continues. Well, I mean, I guess the other options, can we just say that we're gonna do take longer than 60 to 90 on this particular property? I mean, I, I mean, I guess the other option is to approve it now or approve it in the second reading. I should be more precise, but, and we just commit that we give a longer period of time here. Is that optimal, I think, for everyone is gonna be a third party sell, uh, it, it, I think, you know, is, is my assumption here. You know, the only thing I'd add is I, I wouldn't be here today if somebody, I had reached somebody at BDS in the third week of August, if I'd had a return call, if I had had the right number to begin with, I don't need that much time. I imagine you and I could get this settled in, out in the hallway. Whatever the lien amount is, I just want to try to resolve it because it includes a, a lot of penalties because they kept doubling when those re notices weren't responded to. Of course they are. So we're, we're, I don't mean to push us, but it seems like we're, we're making a lot of the same points over and mm -hmm. over again. Um, I tend did, to did do that. Did that finish your questioning? I think so. Right. Yeah. Commissioner Ryan and then Commissioner Maps. Yeah, because second oh, readings are often mm -hmm. quiet, I want to acknowledge um, Commissioner Lindbergh for being here and you, Beth, on that Killingsworth property, the nightmare on Killingsworth. I know our office sent you a lot of emails on that matter as well. So that was great to have on this. Um, on this matter, I just would like to put this out there. This is the first reading. So we have a week. It look, can you all like figure this out between this week and next week? And then if we have a well thought out amendment, um, we could uh, deal with that next week. I just don't feel comfortable with a walk on amendment at this moment. I've learned my lesson on those. I'm sure we all have. And so I do think that there's merit in this dialogue that's taking place, but us trying to figure it out in the emotion of this uh, moment just doesn't seem like a wise idea. So I would be looking forward to the staff getting back to us. I'm looking at you, Commissioner Rubio, because I know you're on it. So does that make any sense? Yeah, that I, that I appreciate that um, suggestion, and I would encourage that if, if, if staff can Thank you. figure out before Thank the you. next well, Thank you. Mr. Baker, could you just clarify something for me? You, you said she has no existing family. Is that accurate? To my knowledge, she has no parents. Um, her brother, her only brother passed away. Yeah. No, her husband no, no. died. I, I'm totally sorry. Neither she nor her brother had children, so there's no nephews. La later on, you said she's living with family members? She's living with a family. She's living a with... Family. She's but not her family? Not her family, Got no. It. In okay. fact, she's not even in Oregon now. She's temporarily down in San Jose with this family. They're trying to find an assisted living facility for her. It, it gets more complicated. All right, very, very good. But she has and, no and, family. She, um, she literally was just out there. F fair enough. And I'll, I'll put all my cards on the table. Um, I disagree with you, but I may take one of your business cards for future reference. Uh, I, I appreciate your advocacy. Um, I, I, you know, my personal view is we should move forward with the process. And if you can swing a miracle, great. The, the process leaves plenty of flexibility. Again, uh, the burden is on government in the foreclosure process, and there are many, many opportunities for those who are being foreclosed upon to stop the process, reverse the process, whatever. And, and you have that opportunity, but my, my strong recommendation is that we move forward as we proceed. Uh, colleagues, with that, I'd, I'd like to uh, vote on the amendments before I move this to second. The first amendment was to remove property number nine. Keelan, did you have a question? Nope. Call the roll. Gonzalez. Aye. Maps. Aye. Rubio. Aye. Ryan. Aye. Wheeler. Aye. 
the amendments adopted. Colleagues, uh, is there further their discussion on the second amendment, which was to remove property number three from the list? Seeing none, call the roll. Gonzalez. Aye. Knapps. Aye. Rubio. Aye. Ryan. Aye. Wheeler. Aye. The amendments adopted. Finally, the uh, amendment to update the title of the ordinance. Any further discussion? Seeing none, please call the roll. Gonzalez. Aye. Maps. Aye. Rubio. Aye. Ryan. Aye. Wheeler. Aye. The amendment is adopted. I want to thank everybody for their testimony. Mr. Thank Baker, you. thank you for being here and provoking what I, I thought was a really valuable conversation. I want to thank staff for their hard work on this. This is a first reading of a non-emergency ordinance. It moves to second reading as amended. Last item, colleagues, oh, yeah. 768 uphold consent agenda item. Amend business license law code to require certain tax returns be filed electronically. Colleagues, not all tax software providers make city tax forms available online, which inhibits tax preparers' ability to file electronically. This item would mandate electronic filing for tax professionals in alignment with requirements at the state and federal level. Uh, folks, folks, we're, we're still in session here, thank you. Uh, in alignment with requirements at the state and federal level and would result in an increase in form availability from tax software providers. Audit and accounting manager Scott Carter and policy analyst Don Jones from the Bureau of Revenue and Financial Services are here to answer additional questions about the item. I'm gonna turn this over to Commissioner Gonzalez since he had pulled the item yeah. to, to get whatever concerns he has out on the table. I just wanted to get a quick overview of this and understand what we're doing in terms of accessibility for English second language speakers, uh, non-primary. Uh, there's always some concerns about digital uh, accessibility in certain communities. Now, it looks like we're doing this to support and encourage software providers to fill the gaps. So I just would like to understand what we're doing to address any language concerns about an all digital pathway. Great, and I think we have staff somewhere? Online. Online. Oh, there we go. Uh, uh, it looks like we have uh, Scott. Scott, can you unmute? There you are. Yep. Okay. So uh, thank you. My computer froze up for about the last thirty seconds of what you said, Commissioner Gonzalez. Can you restate? Um, it? Yeah, I just want to understand what we're doing to assure accessibility for those that may have uh, language barriers, English as a second language, as well as uh, just how we're uh, sort of addressing digital uh, issues for low income, yep. Yep. lower uh, income. Okay, I, again, I'm Scott Carter. I'm the audit and accounting manager with the revenue division. Uh, I, I think as far as the, the electronic filing, I don't know if this if your question directly relates to that, but that's just one way that, that the return gets to us. But we do have a lot of uh, uh, efforts that go toward making sure our uh, forms, especially the, the most used forms like the arts tax forms are in uh, uh, several languages, I believe 12 at last count. Uh, we also have uh, an initiative uh, with our uh, business license programs. We've been focusing on uh, providing Spanish uh, instructions and uh, you know pretty robust uh, body of, of, um, of uh, speak, you know non non English speakers. And we also are with our online our our alternative way to file online, which is called Pro Portland Revenue Online. We're working on adding uh, Spanish uh, features to that um, regularly. And th this is something that's been in the forefront with us uh, recently to uh, even take it further. Got it. But the bottom line is we're going to be requiring that these returns be filed electronically. And is, yep. I was just curious if there's, outside of what we're already doing with the respective forms, is there any game plan for addressing English second language? and? There's just sometimes a challenge with going all digital for certain communities. I just wanted to make sure we thought through that. that yep, we did meet with one of the tax software development companies, their government representative, and they uh, they stated they were uh, um, they were enhancing the non-English components of their talk tax software packages. Um, we we actually we're we're trying to. Um, I don't want to use the word prod, but we're trying to encourage the tax software development companies to include uh, electronic filing in their forms. But they're uh, they're the ones that actually uh, um, address those issues. Um, but it should, you know, things should run 
so they wouldn't even know that they're they're working with the city so that the onus would be on the tax soft, software providers to provide that additional um, the additional languages and resources such as those okay i mean i'll, I'll support it i i just would ask that we keep an eye out on this in yep. terms of yep. what we're communicating on our websites for in in second you know if, for non-English speakers as best we can. Um, I appreciate thank you. that. Thanks for the okay. background. They're sure. Very good. Any other questions? No. Any public testimony? No one signed This is the second really reading. Please it. call the roll. Gonzalez. Aye. Maps. Um, I want to thank Commissioner Gonzalez for pulling this item and raising the important question about uh, language accessibility in this space. Um, and it seems like we might still have some work to do here. Uh, um, <laughs> yeah. I, 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 I think it's is probably the uh, uh, what I learned today. Um, I don't have a solution, but I certainly uh, look forward to working with my with staff and colleagues on council to make sure that um, the software that we use to interact with the public is accessible to everyone, regardless of what your first language is. Uh, in the meantime, I vote aye. Rubio, aye. Ryan. Yeah, thank you, Commissioner Gonzalez, for bringing this forward. Uh, I didn't really hear the accountability um, in that answer with how we'll work with those uh, providers. Um, so anyway, I'm, this, I'm, thanks for raising it, the issue. So we had dialogue about it. And now let's all tune in to make sure that we actually reach the services that um, we kind of had an idealistic viewpoint on, but I didn't hear any real accountability. So thanks for bringing this up, and we need to monitor it. I vote aye. Wheeler. Aye. The ordinance is adopted. We're adjourned until 2 p.m.